All right. What's up? Welcome. It's that time again. Another night. Another feral bunch of crazy baloney. Coming in hot. Fresh from the frying pan. We've never tried it on a Friday night though. We usually get our own unique blend of, of feral individuals coming in hot on the weekday. What about on a Friday night? Hopefully you all got to see uh, today's installment of Lord Voldemort. We had a lot of fun over there today. Jamie joined me. I got my cool 90s guy hair falling down on my face. How are you going to beat a guy in a debate? This guy, like... Jamie said I could look like a 90s cool guy boyfriend. And I said, okay, I'll go with that. Imagine losing a debate to a 90s cool guy alternative boyfriend. That's what's going to happen to you tonight when you try to <laughs> you try to make your dumb arguments. I'm just kidding with you. It's okay. You're not dumb. Tonight, we're going to open it up. Why not? I even got our buddy, the famous whiteboard. It's a whiteboard summer. If you haven't heard, I got it ready to go. Because I know we're going to have some some heat. We're going to have some smoke. So we can help clear up the confusion via the whiteboard. Tonight, the topics are, as you probably have surmised, Catholicism, Atheism, Protestantism, Islam, Paganism. Neo-paganism. That means we can talk about why you believe there is no God, why you think I'm crazy and wrong. We'll talk about philosophical topics, logic, transcendental argumentation. Is it a good argument? Is it a bad argument? Transcendental argument for God, that is. We'll talk about recent topics I've covered. Maybe you're a Petersonian. You want to talk about my take on Jordan Peterson. We can talk about that. You want to talk about the essence of distinction. You want to talk about absolute divine simplicity. You want to talk about the history of the papacy. You want to talk about John Calvin, Calvinism, James White. You want to talk about Trent Horn. You want to talk about Taylor Marshall, Trad Cats, whatever. As long as it's in those domains, we'll talk about it. So you want to talk about the papacy. You want to talk about whatever. Eastern religions, man. Natural theology. It's open forum. That means you can have the floor. The rules are you can make arguments as long as you want. You can make whatever presentation you want within reason. You can't talk for an hour. Don't nobody want to listen to you doing your slam poetry. We don't care about your latest rap. We don't care about your the single that you're about to drop. Ain't nobody over here interested in. The only music that we like over here is called Crunch Core. That's my music. Which I'll be doing live in L.A., by the way, if you sign up for the L.A. event July 6th. Tickets available in the show description. In the show ascriptions. You're going to need some prescriptions. Um, All you got to do is request to speak. You call in via Twitter spaces. It doesn't have to be a debate. You don't have to debate if you don't want to. If you feel like you just want to ask a question that's also good we we that's acceptable however i'm not going to talk about geopolitics i'm not going to talk about conspiracies i'm not going to talk about how you think i'm a kgb sorcerer um i'm not going to talk about how hot you think i am we all know you think i'm hot that's fine we're not going to talk about um what else mama jokes no mama jokes allowed we're not going to talk about what else is everybody else? Crazy people are calling. They want to talk about crazy stuff. We're not going to talk about uh, your Gnostic vision quest and how you're the bloodline of the grail and all this nonsense like that one guy. No, sorry. If you make dumb arguments, I'm going to call them out. If you uh, get sassy, I'm going to get sassy right back. It's, well, you're going to get some sass. If you're cool, you'll get cool. Eye for an eye around here. It's straight up Lex Talionis, baby. So the way it works is you request to speak. You call in via Twitter Spaces. Unfortunately, Twitter Spaces only works on the app. 
So if you're on a PC or whatever, it's not going to work. You got to be on your phone to call in via Twitter spaces. I have put the link in many times. Can we talk about how you know you're hot? Uh, again, we already know that I'm hot, but that would be a meta level question. Do I know that I know that I'm hot? Yes. So, but we can't talk about that. I'm a 10 on a 10 scale, baby. Talking about a weight scale. If you weigh me, my hotness comes out as a 10. I don't even weigh 350 pounds. You probably think, you look upon this man, you think that man weighs 350 pounds at least because of all the beefcake that's full of, he's full of beefcake. So he must weigh 350 pounds. No, when I step on the scale, it's a 10. Why? Because I'm a dime bag. I'm a dime piece. I'm dime bag Daryl. That means that do you, they used, people think that's a weed reference. No, dime bag Daryl, the, the, the women thought he was a hot piece. Dime bag. A 10 piece. We bust in the fourth wall tonight. That's right. It's open for him. That means you can have the floor. You can tell me why I'm wrong. You can refute me. You can bust the, my chops. You can uh, demolish me, annihilate me, do whatever it is you want to do. Just keep it to argumentation. That's it. Some dude caught on it. He said, I'm a. Um, I got a 40 point IQ above you. How do you know my IQ, dude? He's like, I'm at least 40 points IQ higher than you. Now, it's got to be trolling. But who knows? You never know. Dude, almost, It's almost impossible to troll. I hope he comes in here. I mean, this dude was talking some serious smack. He's got the highest IQ of anybody in the Twitter space, for sure. And he said he's going to set me straight. I'm not joking about this. Dude's like, you're a dick. And my IQ is at least 40 points higher than you. <laughs> I mean, anybody that's like shouting out their IQ on Twitter, come on, dude. You got to be trolling. You can't be taking yourself serious. Where's he at? What's his name? T Free. T Free 817. I'll send him a damn space. Where's you? Where are you at, T Free? Put me in my place. Come shoot me down. He's like, you're a dick, dude. Buffalo Billions. What's up, dude? You're on. Put me in my place. Set me straight. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, sir. What's going on, man? Um, So, uh, first of all, I was just wondering if you have any, if you know of any resources um, that would be useful in finding a saint for intersensory prayer, you know, for specific stuff. Um do you know of any resources like that? It, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, you mean for like a specific issue, like saints related to travel or, or health issues? Or is that what you're talking exactly. about? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I mean, you could probably just go to the Rocor website and there's probably lists of saints there. Okay. But I mean, okay. yeah, that's a good question. I don't have like a... I think, you know, the Orthodox Church is basically just, you just attend the liturgy and then you'll find them in the calendar, I guess. But did you have any issues you disagree with or anything like that? No, I didn't really. Um, I just saw that you put Q&A in the title as well. That's fine. And, That's cool. Um, I was just wondering about But uh, I also wanted to thank you for the, I've been following you for a couple of years and um, I'm loving the Twitter spaces because it just goes to show that you're not fearing anyone and that they're free to come join, but no one's, no one big is really coming to challenge you, you know? Yeah, of course, I think a lot of those people are going to just say, well, uh, it's not a formal debate and uh, he's going to cheat or whatever. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I mean, if they really wanted to come have a conversation, it'd be easy to, to set up. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I've been That's trying the true. whole last week to, to get some kind of Roman Catholic discussion, but I get tired of the old, same old papal debates. They always want to debate the papacy. I, I want to debate some yeah. other interesting things like, you know, at least yeah. at least Trent was willing to debate. Uh, you know, natural theology, which was cool. So I like to debate, I don't know, the history of the geopolitical entanglements of the papacy. Nobody ever wants to debate that. I think that's actually uh, a much a much more grounded, realistic assessment of what's going on in the 20th century papacy. Uh, so I, I, I've posed the debate something like, what's about, like, uh, 
is the pap does the papacy still maintain um, how did I word it let me see how I word it I, I worded it really well in this uh, tweet here that I sent let me see I sent this to a couple people but nobody will come debate this they don't want to debate the uh, is the papacy a captured captured institution of geopolitical powers or is it still the infallible divinely guided chair that Christ established I'd really like to debate something like that but they never want to debate that um, they only want to debate, well, of course, it's, of course it's infallible. Yeah, and you, uh, you, uh, ortho bros getting owned because they don't have a central authority. <laughs> All right, what's up? Fola, Fola Ajabade. Sounds like a Muslim. Hello. What's up, dude? How you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I've just got two questions really okay uh the first one would be like how do we historically like affirm that we have apostolic succession how do we know that we have it like in a specific yeah, church yeah. i think every church has a record of like who ordained who so you know it's it's even you know, like, it's even posted uh, on websites you mean like how is it not yeah, made is it made up yeah yeah how, like, how do we affirm that that list well, for one, I think we can have a basic reliable trust, a basic reliability when it comes to the history of the church that these churches have existed since the first and second century. And we have writings going all the way back to those times. So like what, what why would it be questionable that there is a succession? Are you saying like from a Protestant perspective, like what if a Protestant says, you made yeah. that up? Right now, well, we can actually go read the Church Fathers, and they consistently talk about apostolic succession. So you can read Book 3, Irenaeus talks about it. You can read Cyprian talking about it. You can read, you know, the 1st, 2nd, 3rd century Church Fathers all talk about apostolic succession, and they list it, right? Like, in, in uh, against Heresies, Book 3, Irenaeus says, look to the preeminent Church of Rome, founded by Peter and Paul, and you can see the succession of the bishops from uh, the apostolic period in the Church of Rome, so... Even Anglicans admit apostolic succession. Yeah, but wouldn't it wouldn't it be like an like an issue? Because some of them say like, um, for example, like was his name Ignatius or Polycarp? They don't directly claim to be taught by Peter and like Peter and Jay and John. So no, actually, so, no. Well, hold on. So Polycarp does claim to be taught by John. So what do you mean? He said he was the disciple of John. Oh. Oh, never mind then. Well, I guess I haven't, I haven't read it properly. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like, it's if you look at Paul's letters to Timothy, he says that the body of things that I taught you, that entire teaching that you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, if you look at Acts, he says he taught in Ephesus for three years, day and night. He says, pass on all of that to men after you, lay on hands, he says, and that is the passing on of the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that body of deposit, that, that body of faith, that the doctrines that are deposited by the laying on of hands through the teaching uh, of the ministry that Paul laid hands on, on Timothy, he says, you can lay hands on men after you, but don't do it hastily because it passes on the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's apostolic succession in the letters to Timothy. Okay. Uh, that's, thanks for that. But, yeah. And uh, well, the second question would be... Um, on uh, Gregory of Nyssa, because I've heard that... Um, on what? Gr Gregory of Nyssa. Yeah. St. Gregory of Nyssa. And I've heard that he, he, he ends up um, denying uh, classical nu numerical identity when he's talking about, like, not free gods and stuff like that. Uh, you talking about, the, like, the Muslim argument from that Jake makes or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think Dr. Branson has dealt with this. Like, there, there's no such thing as like a a, a universal uh, numerical style of like how we number how we number things, right? So the fact that people are using like modern numerical uh, attribution and saying, "Oh, they didn't they didn't do it the right way back then," um, you know, he's just he's just saying that so that he can do his uh, LPT argument, which again trades on. The fact that God it only picks out one thing. So you can have something being one uh, and also many, right? And so he's just kind of like assuming that there's only one way to talk about numbers or there's only one way to speak of something being one, uh, depending upon, again, like what time period we're talking about. And it's just not true. There's no such, there's no such thing as a, quote, classical 
universal number theory. By the way, Islam doesn't have that, so I don't know how, how he thinks that that's going to help Islam. Uh, thanks, thanks, sir. thanks sir. Yeah, man, good questions. So tonight we're taking uh, preferably people who disagree. So uh, if you have a issue you want to debate, an issue you want to discuss, a topic you disagree with, you're welcome to Gregorios. Hello? Yeah, what's up? All right. I am Orthodox, uh, but I mainly had a theological topic, and we, we do disagree. Um, so I, I support icons of God the Father. I was wondering if you would, if that was on topic enough. Sure. Uh, so the first question I would have would be, what would be the basis for drawing, say, like the... Uh, so we, we typically say that the basis for icons is that, you know, Christ became incarnate. Um, my question would be, what would be the basis for uh, things like theophanies being depicted? Uh, the basis is that the theophanies are picking out, just like the icons are picking out, the hypostasis. So the theophany is the hypostasis of the sun manifesting in an energetic way. So what what I so I, I looked into this and I actually made a video that got a, a little bit popular at the time that I made it. I I looked into the topic um, and I because there are like many miracles that I sort of had a very difficult time reconciling. So uh, some examples miracles yet. Like, well, hold on, miracles you had a hard time reconciling. What do you mean? There are a lot of miracles that have, or icons that are miraculous that have even been like commanded to be made by the Theotokos that have the icon of God the Father in them. Well, so do you think that the normative way that we go about doing theology is claims of miracles? No, but I, 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 how do I, how do I put it? I, I found it very difficult to ha have a consistent view. Why is it difficult to have a consistent view? I mean, to me, it seems that the logic of the Seventh Council and the canons and then the Moscow councils is pretty consistent. So what's what's inconsistent with it? So your only hangout was that there's claims of miracles around certain icons. I mean, it's the entire like, I mean, you would have to remove a large portion of like the entire Russian tradition. Well, so let's be clear, because. It's not forbidding all depictions of God the Father. It's certain depictions. And so the, the Moscow icon synods were called precisely because there was heterodox iconography that was influencing the Russian church. And so a lot of the icons were teaching the filioque, right? So you're familiar with that? Yes, uh, yes. Okay. So, but don't you think that the logic and the theology and the argumentation of like John Damascus and the seventh council about not depicting the father, is that not no longer, it doesn't hold or what? Well, I, I don't, I don't think the intention of the icons is to depict the, the hypostasis. I think they're depicting a energetic manifestation. I agree with that. So that, so like when I see like the cursed root icon or I see the Port Arthur icon, like, yeah, it's, it's a man in the sky, quote unquote, but it, it's not a depicting person in the same way that we would depict Christ. Okay. Well then, I mean, that part is, I think probably harmonizable. I wouldn't have a disagreement so with that. That's what I was saying, because there's a, a lot of people who are very against it, but there, there are articles in Greek and Russian that you have to translate that explain it more in depth. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted to, to bring it up because I haven't heard I haven't some, heard someone publicly defend it in the, in this way before, and I, I think it's pretty important with our iconographic understanding. Yeah, as long as we understand that we're not depicting the person of the Father, uh, yeah, I, I think there is room for some flexibility there, and that's why the Ancient of Days icon it is a Father, but it's a Father presented as Christ in the way he's presented in Ezekiel and Apocalypse 1, which is, you know, with white hair and this kind of stuff. So, 
well, it, I mean, if you pay attention to the, the Russian tradition of depicting God the Father, I mean, he's like encased in clouds and things. And in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit has, you know, an energetic manifestation of clouds and sure. things like that. The, the, the so that, kind of, yeah. That, that, that's, I, I just wanted to bolster that and to, you know, start a discussion about it. Because, I mean, that's genuinely what I think. And I think the miracles are consistent with that view. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. So I don't think we're... I don't think we disagree there. So yeah, I don't think it's it's not a prohibition of all uh, depiction or imagery. It's specifically, ultimately, the person of the Father, and that logic and argumentation is the same for the Holy Spirit, right? There is no uh, direct image of the hypostasis of the Spirit. We don't know the what the hypostasis of the Spirit is, but He's manifested as tongues of fire, cloud, and so forth, right? Yeah. Well, that's Dove. all. Thank you. Yeah, uh, good questions there. I'm glad you made that clear. I think that that actually does clear things up. Uh, let's see who is. We got a bunch of different people here. Ungar Nicholas, what's up, dude? Got to unmute, dog. Hello, how's it going, Jader? What's up, man? Uh, I just want to tell you, I'm a, I am a, a pretty big fan of yours, and I do like your content um, on okay. Infowars. I've been on Infowars several times. Okay. Um, um, I have a Substack, um, nickanonymous.substack.com, and I'm writing an article currently, and I wanted to bounce some things off you and uh, get your opinion. All right. So, but the topics tonight are i'm not being rude to you but it's it's atheism catholicism islam paganism do you have a theological religious kind of disagreement it, or it's an ism it's a political ism okay what I, i'm writing an article about um neo malthusianism and i'm writing an article about um internationalism and i i i, I have the, i have a belief that this talk of globalism is actually some kind of a facade. It's mm. kind of like a. Uh, I, I believe it's actually uh, when when somebody like Trump talks about globalism, he actually is talking about internationalism, and and he kind of masks that. Uh, okay, so, but the topic tonight is theological stuff. So I'm not trying to be rude to you, but uh, we're going to move on to. If you have a disagreement about theology, religion, that's fine. Criminally, something. I can't see the rest of your name. So it's open forum tonight, not on conspiracy and geopolitics, which is what I said at the beginning of the show. So not being rude. Maybe you weren't here for that. So we're not uh, not here to talk about that. Go ahead. Hello. What's up? Hey, how are you? I'm um, great, man. How are you? I, I'm pretty good. I just um, I, I want to give you some... Uh, um, Congratulations. I, I think you are a, a very good um, a, a proponent of, of of what you believe. Okay. Uh, I also I also consider you like a modern day kind of Gene Scott. Who's Gene uh, Scott? You, you do know Gene Scott. Uh, if you're no. familiar Who's with Gene the, Scott? Um, if you're familiar with uh, Werner Herzog's uh, documentaries, he did a, a documentary on Gene Scott. The, uh, okay, who's Gene Scott? Angry Man of God, I think. Something, or I think that was the title. I'm not. Oh I'm man, not sure. you think I'm like some kind of crazy Pentecostal preacher? Good grief, dude! <laughs> yeah, well, I, it, not, not in that way. Uh, I, I would say you were in, in a good. I, I would try to do it as more of a, a compliment. I would say you do it a good job, of, but in, in in a kind of way of. Um, uh, uh, you're very literate and oh is this is he the one that uh would smoke and cuss like he's got a cigar oh i I don't know about the cigar i'm not sure well he's yeah i'm looking at him he's sitting here with a cigar so anyway not sure he does have anyway uh where i'm coming from is um uh i guess how do i sum it up uh uh, someone who was i guess christian brought up somewhat Mm -hmm. uh grew up Grew up Lutheran, uh, became, you know, Presbyterian. Tried to, you know, with, with, as a believer as you could be. Um, but it, it, in light of, you know, I mean, so much. 
Okay. Well, let me let me put it this way. Um, if you can, if you could summarize religion, if you could, you know, put it into some, you know, it is a part of what we are as as humans, as primates, and what it's come from. It was our first explanation of the world. It's our explanation of, you know, everything. Uh, our first attempt at science. And so you would have to believe that for hundreds of thousands of years that, uh, you know, the world just exists. And then a few thousand years ago, uh, God comes along in, in, in this place and says, okay, we've got to do something about this. And, and, and here we go. Here's, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get involved. And then, you know, but I, I just I can't reconcile the science, the archaeology, the, uh, the the observations we have around us, the the, the science we have with. Oh, like uh, would this be like the same science that says that uh, biology is not determined by chromosomes? That science? What science? Biology is not determined by chromosomes. Yeah, your gender. No, not at all. Um, oh, so that's not good science. Is that good? Is that because that's the science today, right? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think there are two sexes, as far as I know. Okay, but what I'm saying is, so what's the true science here? Okay, so I, I would land on the side of observable science. I mean, science that you can be, mm. you know, actually, you know, tested in in reality. Mm-hmm. Not, not not social science not not any any type of um is a uh, is a do, is the doctor count a conservative does the, I, the, I, I, the doctors count because i mean they're the ones saying that I mean, they do a lot of ob- observable uh i mean they're the ones that are actually like changing the peepees right well okay i i, I mean no I, I i am against all that I mean, let, let me take it. Okay, let me ask you this. You know, as as I respect you as as a fellow primate, as as a fellow human, but you know, we we come from other humans. We are Homo sapiens sapiens now, but okay. we have come from a long line of other. You know. Okay, what does that? What what's that have to do with anything to do with God's existence? So. Okay, I I, I can understand that, but. I mean, you would have to believe that for 300,000 years, there was no Christianity as we are talking about today. I, th- there was, n- there was no, where, where are you getting the 300,000 years? Is that an observable thing? Or did you observe that? Well, would you give me 100,000? Oh, you can make it as many aeons as you want. Are any of those aeons observable? Are those people any less valuable than, than the humans that exist today? I asked you a question, so then you two quote quote me. Are any of those humans obser- is that is that observable at all? The humans in the hunt the, the ape men, the pilt down man in the hundred thousand year time frame that you're talking about. Have you observed yes. that? Okay. Uh, well they would be observable in archaeological evidence, yes. I mean we, we have proof that there were like you know like pilt down man like, like who? Like pilt down man, Nebraska man, are those good examples? There are, uh, I, yeah, I mean, there would be some. There would oh, be, you know, well, those are frauds, I mean, though. Well, those are frauds. They're, they're... Go ahead. Those are frauds. Okay. They're, fam- I, I, they're famous I mean, frauds. I deny that there are. Um, but, you, you, I mean, you would also well, the say ones that, that there, you is, agree. there is archaeological evidence that does go back hundreds of thousands of years, oh, correct? Says who? Um, Science? Science? <laughs> Well, I, okay. uh, yeah, so it's funny, I mean, it, but now wait a minute. You said it was observable science, so I'm just wondering, like, you didn't observe it, so but an, a scientific establishment claims to have observed it, but they didn't observe it either, right? Well, y- yes. I mean, we are obs- we, we are assuming that it is, you know, it is something that is. You well, know, that's a pretty big, pretty been, big assumption. Has been excavated from the ground, has been studied, has been, you know. I mean, it has been built upon for many years, mm. and, and it's something that's not, you know, it, it's not a, uh, in the sense that science, I mean, it's not something that's perfect, but it is something that does, you know, 
have a usefulness. Well, right? sounds I mean, it's something that we can measure, right? I mean, we can measure ice cores. We can measure tree rig. Okay. We can, how we do can how are how are there fossils that extend below and between various ice cores that should not be there? In in what in what instance? No, there's, many the, you, the there's, many you, you, there's many of them. You can you there there's many things. of them. You can look them up, right? What about the fly geyser? The fly geyser is supposedly, you know, that's something that takes uh, I think a uh, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand years to form, and it formed in forty years. So, how's that possible? No, I, I would I wouldn't doubt their events, and I'm not a scientist oh. at all. Oh no, wait a minute. I, so you're not a scientist. So this is not your observation. No, it's not. Right. It's, so it's, you've accepted a, a new well, the, you've accepted a new authority that's not based on the, any of your own. Well, for the vast for the vast majority of humans, it's never going to be a, a, you know something that yeah. they're assigned. But that 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 same scientific establishment now says that a man can be a woman, and you said no, I don't believe that. So you don't so you don't follow the science. Well, I I, I don't think that the the serious scientists oh really like the ta like the tavistock not, institute the tavistock you know, is, more than so tavistock is not a serious science entity you don't you don't think the biggest most I, I powerful think, clinics in the, the united well, states which are pushing out vanderbilt university is not uh, an authoritative scientific institution i thought it was like the preeminent medical institution I, I wouldn't give it that. I, I, I don't. I don't oh, know. Vanderbilt like, University. Like university. Okay. Like right. That. Like All right. The, so the, Vanderbilt, the, the, the premier, Vanderbilt. yeah, the premier medical institution in the United States, according to you, now isn't that because you haven't given it that the, title. The, the United States is two hundred years old. I mean, uh, the, these things go back far beyond, you know, our, our, even our own country. I gave you an uh, example of a medical institution that is esteemed as one of the top medical institutions in the country, which is a spearhead of the idea that you can become a woman if you're a man. And you're saying, I don't accept that authority. I, I, I think that's twisted by social sciences. I, I, oh. I, I think that's... So they're not I really doing this. It's social just, science, but they're not really doing it. They're not really changing... I, I think they're trying to do things. I think they're trying to change things. I, I, I don't. Yeah. So I don't all you've done is normal. adopt. All you've done is adopt a new authority structure. And when it comes down to it, there's not actually any real basis for you to believe these things. Other than that, a lot of people believe it, and a lot of powerful people believe it. But you yourself have not verified any of these things. But well, yes. I mean, I mean, there's only so much that one human can do. I mean, I mean so it, it operates kind of like on a faith-based thing. It sounds like a faith-based thing for you. I, I see what you're saying in that sense, but okay, uh, that's true. You're also making a faith-based claim. Correct, because I believe and everything at root. Yeah. Claims. Correct. I do. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And, and you know. So who? So, so whose worldview? More likely. So who? Is, no. Is, well, whose what, worldview is more consistent? Because likelihood is going to depend upon more fundamental presuppositions. So, I think I have a consistent worldview, which can give an account for how we know things, how we have ethics, how we live in the world. But I don't, I, I don't believe that the atheist naturalist worldview that I hear you presenting can give an account for any of those things. I don't necessarily think that any of the scientific world accounts that you're, you're, you're refuting a lot of, a lot of things that there are probably is probably a lot of evidence for and that it probably cannot be oh, right but you don't know that just probably maybe I, I, maybe probably well let me ask you this way uh can can science provide us with ethics no that's i mean that's not its job that's not uh that's not what it should do okay but it can provide truth well, I think it can provide insight into reality, yes, I, I, oh. in, into what exists. Okay. But it can't do anything with values. Do you think truth pertains to no. values? The true and the false don't relate to values? Should you follow the true as opposed to the false? Yeah, I, I think you should not deceive yourself, yes. I, I think you should not be... Oh, so it does pertain to values. Well, I, I don't think that believing in 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 fairy tales is 
Well, you're calling it a fairy tale. Well, I'm 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 saying on your position, it sounds like all values would be a fairy tale. But you just told me that you should follow what's true. Why ought I follow what's true in your worldview? Follow what's true. Uh, well, what do we know that's true? How do we know? You well, know, you said science we can give us. It's you said science gives us an insight into to reality. You said that it pertains to what is true. And I said, does the true relate to value judgments like the true versus the false? Ought I follow the true versus the false? Well, that's value judgments. But you said science doesn't give value judgments. So I'm trying to figure out why ought I follow what's true in your view? What, what's the basis for your ethics? Well, I think ethics are an extension of what we are as humans over many many years okay but that wasn't an ex- explanation I, that's not an explanation for why i ought and, to and if you look i mean if, if you look at evolution and okay. and that's not an explanation for why i ought to do something right that's a that's a story about the past but but it, it gives us an insight into what we are today well there's no but what why is that telling me what i ought to do ought can you get an ought from an is I mean, you would have to nail that down for me. What do you exactly mean by that? By stating how things are doesn't tell me how they ought to be. So you can tell me all day long that we're primates and we're apes and we came from, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but how ought we live? What's the basis for the ethics of the value judgments there? Because a minute ago you were saying we should follow what's true. Why should I do anything in your worldview? What's the basis for the shoulds, the ought, the value judgments, the ethics? Would, would that not come I mean I, I don't the one thing is I have to tell you I don't discount religion as part of the of the overall human process of trying to find uh, the, the truth of reality so I mean I would never say that you know we we don't need religion historically I mean it, we it was part of what got us to the point where we are now but going forward do we still need to believe in Zeus and Thor and, you know. So and, none of that was an answer these. to or a very simple question. I would think that with all of your sophistication and the knowledge of science that you're propounding, that we would have some way to account for what we ought to do. But I'm not hearing why I ought to follow what you're saying or any other value judgment. I, I don't ask you to follow me, though. I but wait a minute. You, you said that I should... Me. Uh, no, no, no. You said I should follow what's true, namely the science. Why should I follow anything? That's an ought. That's a that's a value judgment. Ethics. Right. Well, I I would not follow another primate, another human, who makes... Okay, then I don't... Then I shouldn't listen to... claims... So I shouldn't listen to your arguments? are beyond what, you know... What are believable? What are are provable? Or, or even okay, but I'm asking you basic a, assumptions. I mean, I'm asking you a question on, that's on what? I'm asking you a question that's prior to that claim, which is about value judgments themselves. How are they possible in your worldview? It's a very simple question. How how are okay? Can you rephrase? So ethics, value judgments. It's a specific domain of philosophy, right? When you said that you should follow what's true, namely the science, that is an ethical value judgment claim. But you're going to have to make good on that, given your naturalistic worldview. In the history of philosophy, this is called, can I get an ought from an is? And the answer, of course, is that you can't. There's no ought. There's, science can't give you value judgments. But you told me I should follow what's true versus what's false. So that's an inconsistency in your position. And I'm saying that your position as an atheist naturalist can't even tell me if there are value judgments. It makes them all the time. And yet you're turning around and saying, well, I don't need basis. Value judgments come from, you know, our experience as humans. Okay, that's not, that doesn't tell me what's right or wrong. Their origin doesn't tell me what's right or wrong. What basis should I follow it? Why not? Because it could be false. Because it's a fallacy. Do you know what a, do you know what fallacies are? It's called the genetic fallacy. So the origin of something doesn't d- entail whether it's true or false. 
That's a genetic we fallacy. Have, if we can't cooperate with each other, if we don't understand that murder is and not you're wrong, not, that stealing is not for wrong, all of the sophisticated. If, if we don't understand these things, how how can you progress at all as a society? How have we built this this I mean, again? We value have judge progressing is a value judgment. So you can't tell me what it means to progress. Well, uh, here we are. We, we've yeah. done it. All right. Good try, but we're gonna have to move on. Um. Uh, let's see. We're looking for people who disagree, so I'm not uh, being rude to anybody. But blocked. What's up, blocked? So again, it's like I'm not being rude, but no, just to no idea what we're talking about. Absolutely doesn't know what fallacies are. Doesn't know why they matter. Just like talking, like no idea what I'm talking about. What's up, dude? You gonna mute or not? I mean, I'm mute or not? Hey. Yes, sir. I am starting to wrap my head around, uh, my slow boy head around how Tag is able to kind of refute, refute the, um, like the philosophical framework of atheism. But I think you've mentioned in the past that Tag leads more towards Trinitarian Christian theology than it would to. Uh, say a generic theism. So yeah. my sort of twofold question is, is a, what exactly is the way that it suggests uh, Christian theology? Right. Cause it's so it's an argument. Generic theism, And then, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, you had a two part question. Go ahead. Oh yeah. And then if, um, and then if this is the case, how does it suggest Orthodox Christian theology more so than say Catholic or Protestant theologies? Right, so it's an argument for an entire paradigm. That means it's not just an argument for an abstract God or some sort of uh, speculative thing or some sort of math problem logic. You know, it's an argument for the entire Christian paradigm, meaning not just the existence of God, but also the world that God created, also the, the entirety of the divine revelation that we have in this religion, the Christian metaphysic, the Christian ethic, all of that goes into it. So it's all, it's like a package deal. So I'm not saying it's true because I'm making the argument for a package deal. I'm saying that the argument hinges on it being a package deal, right? So it's not an argument that can pick out God apart from the rest of the divine revelation. So it's an argument for the whole of Christian revelation, and that includes a specific metaphysic. And the reason that Protestantism and Roman Catholicism don't work is because they have fundamental meta metaphysical problems due to uh, their erroneous doctrines of God. Uh, so they have an uh, insufficient, uh, incoherent model of the Trinity, first and foremost, whereby there's no essence energy distinction. L literally, the uh, Orthodox Church is the only religion in the world that has a consistent presentation of the essence energy distinction, and it's very fundamental to how we ground uh, the created order. So if I'm going to ground the created order in a form of divine conceptualism, it can't be the divine essence. And so Thomism, Roman Catholicism typically identifies the divine ideas with the divine essence. And so that would actually undercut the possibility of grounding the particulars in God. They would be canceled out. They would be, or they would be necessary because the divine essence is necessary. So they have to be energies. They have to be logi. Um, they can't be the divine essence. And that's, so that's just one thing, but also the problem of the one and the many uh, my argument is that the Roman Catholic system has a uh, much more tilted over in a, in a, into modalism, absolute divine simplicity, which is uh, dogmatized at the Fourth Lateran Council, pretty much makes, I think, God uh, more or less a monad. Uh, it's more of a modalistic position. So I know they give verbal credence to the Trinity, but really it's slided over into um, dialectical essentialism or neoplatonism so none of those systems so i would say that just as much as the roman catholic doctrine uh falls it falls as much as neoplatonism falls because i see them as basically the same thing so uh the essence energy distinction is utilized by the cappadocians against neoplatonic presuppositions uh from eunomius and you can demonstrate that eunomius has explicit neoplatonic uh, presuppositions and argumentation he basically just copies from plotinus when he makes his um, Unitarian argument. So, uh, so that's part of it. And I mean, Protestantism is just by default, uh, Augustinianism. So 
the models are going to be determined by the, the god that they have as the determining factor for the worldview for the system. So if I have a polytheistic god, for example, that's going to give me a chaotic metaphysic overall. If I have a uh, orthodox Trinitarian uh, model where there's equal ultimacy between unity and uh, multiplicity in the triad, that's going to give me a unique approach to things like the problem of the one, the many in the history of philosophy. So those are a couple examples of why the Christian metaphysic. Others could be given as well. Uh, Maximus makes an interesting argument for uh, on the basis of the incarnation of the Logos and that uh, human knowledge needs to be grounded not just in uh, the divine in a general sense, but it, the divine in a, a concrete sense. And so he ar argues that we actually have to ground it in an incarnate Logos, which again is against the notion of the Neoplatonic uh, theological presuppositions. So, so those are a bunch of examples that, again, most world religions uh, are monistic or dualistic. So orthodox metaphysics is premised on not being monistic and not being dualistic. Okay. So I, I could follow about half of that, but <laughs> basically, it, so if I'm at the point where I can wrap my head around how tag gets you past, uh, past atheism, then the next thing in order to narrow it down, I, I need to dig into essence energies, right? Well, the essence energy distinction is just a outflowing of, uh, correct Trinitarian theology. And so Cappadocian Trinitarian theology is, you know, the, the, we, we, believe, we believe in one God because the Father is the one God. So it's not a, uh, it doesn't put essentialism first, it puts the person of the Father first. And so the personalism and the personhood of the Father comes first. And that makes God uh, not uh, part of a category of philosophical um, classification. So God's not defined or known first and foremost as essence, but as the person of the Father. That's what the creed says. I believe in one God, the Father. It doesn't say I believe in one God, the divine essence. It's true that there is one God because there's one divine essence, but that's not first in our order of theology or the order of theology. So that's very important for Trinitarian theology because that's how we're going to get the sole cause, the, the Cappadocians and the uh, Council of Constantinople define that the sole cause is the person of the Father, Father does not share his causal role with the son. There's no secondary causes in the triad. There's only one cause, and that's the person of the father. All of the rest of the theology flows from that. The essence energy distinction flows from that. So, yeah. Okay. I wish I could sit down with you for like five hours. <laughs> well, I've lectured through. I, that's I why there's that gets me in the right direction. there's a thousand videos. I've lectured through the entirety of John Damascus is on the Orthodox faith. So I would say start with those lectures. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Great questions. Uh, let's see. Looking for people that disagree. So. Uh, if you have questions, that's fine, but I'm looking for uh, people who take issue with the topics are not conspiracies or geopolitics. The topics are Catholicism, atheism, Protestantism, Muslims, pagans. Uh, and if you want to ask questions about apologetics, transcend argument, that's all fine too. Tough love. Uh oh, he's going to give me some tough love. Going to put me in my place. What's up? Yes, sir. Hey, Jay, how you doing? I got a potential potential disagreement, but just okay. a question. I, I apologize if you've addressed this before. It's sure. your stuff, but um, <clears throat> this is about apocatastasis or universal About what? Apocatastasis? Okay, sure. Yeah, um, so I'm a huge fan of Gregory Nyssa. In reading his um, On the Life and Resurrection, he, he's pretty clear in what he his position is on the whole thing. And I think his theology... Sews together um, the view of humanity really well mm -hmm. in terms of, um, and and he makes a lot of sense of Paul as well, and I see that thread all throughout the Patristic Fathers. So I'm kind of wondering why your why your disagreement with that doctrine is so strong. Well, because the Church rejects it in three councils, so it's it's fine to have certain Church Fathers at certain times having. Um, speculations and, and theories, right? And we would say the same thing about Augustine. Augustine has certain speculations and theories about the Trinity that were not accepted at Constantinople I. So uh, the doctrine of apocatastasis 
is rejected uh, at the fifth, sixth, and seventh councils explicitly. So that's the first and foremost yeah, reason. At the fifth, there was anathemas that were appended to the council. After I'm, I'm the council well aware of all that, and it, and it, I'm well aware of that, and I know all of these objections, and it doesn't matter because the sixth and seventh council affirm explicitly, particularly in the four pages that reject originism, exactly what is meant by the rejection of apocatastasis. So there, you, you can say there's a. I mean, I believe in recapitulation, but. The fact that there's recapitulation does not mean that every individual hypostasis is saved or participates in theosis. And even Nyssa says that it's, it does, or Maximus corrects Nyssa and says that the means by which we participate in theosis are particular to each individual hypostasis recapitulating the virtues. So it does not, so the restoration of nature does not necessitate that every individual hypostasis is saved. Right, but reconciliation would imply salvation in the context of Scripture. Yeah, but salvation is not the same thing in every sense. And so that's why Palamas talks about in different modes. So all of nature will be restored, and nature is saved, human nature is saved. But that doesn't mean the individual hypostasis is saved, because that person can go against God and then have a negative, bad experience of the eschaton. Because it, it's it's all about the mode, or the will, the their mode of willing whether they've recapitulated the virtues or not. So they haven't recapitulated the virtues. Their nature is made ever existing or it has ever being, but its experience of God cannot be good because it has rejected God. Right. You experience the love of God like it's wrath if you haven't been reconciled yeah. to Christ in right. this life. Right. Yeah, I, I get that part. It's just, it's just like I come from a Protestant background. I'm trying to figure out if, if, Fathers like this, like Gregory of Nyssa was a pillar of orthodoxy, or Origen, for example. If fathers like Origen this is not a pillar of orthodoxy. He's rejected by uh, the uh, saint, uh, opt uh, either Optidus uh, of his day. So he was rejected in his day by one of the saints. Origen is a heretic who cut off his balls, which is self-mutilation. Uh, and Origen is an Arian, and, and Origen teaches... Uh, you understand that at the Sixth Council, there's a four-page condemnation of the entire system of Origen. So he's a heretic. Yeah, it, but the problem is it's, it's difficult to even decipher how much of that is even accurate about him historically, because there's there's all kinds of things yeah. that are so attributed to Origen. This is your... So, okay, so now the academics know better than the Church Fathers who condemn him. So now the Council... You're not, so you're still a Protestant, because the Councils are not authoritative in their exposition. When St. Sophronius's four-page condemnation of originism is accepted at the Sixth Council, you submit to that. You don't submit to your intellect reading the Church Fathers on your own and figuring out, well, I'm going to follow what I think is the true Christianity of origin and apocatastasis. That's heresy, picking and choosing. Uh, I mean... So you don't care what the Sixth and Seventh Councils say? No, I do care what they say. I just don't know. Like, it's difficult to. It's to not decipher. difficult. It's not. <laughs> I mean, the the condemnations are explicitly clear, including apocatastasis. So you just said, well, they were appended. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if the sixth and seventh councils reaffirm the condemnation of originism. I mean, what about originism would we even want? You understand, Maximus had to write two books called the Ambigua, dealing with all of the problems that origin had created. Do you understand that? All the iconoclasts were motivated by originism. He was a massive problem for the church. Neoplatonism is the greatest plague for the first seven centuries of the church. It's awful. Okay, I'm, I'm not trying to really just go all out on origin. I just brought his name up because I think he was an exegete in the early part of the okay, have, church. That, have, you read, of have you read things. the Ambigua? What's that? Have you read the Ambigua? Okay, so maybe the most famous father of the Sixth Council, St. Maximus, who wrote two, two books correcting mistakes in origin and in Gregory of Nyssa, that might be relevant. I mean, you might want to read that because that's the theology of the Sixth Council of St. Maximus, right? Got it. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be rude to you. I'm just council. saying that originism and apocatastasis, in this sense, are also tools for people at Fordham, David Bentley Hart, and these people to push ecumenism. And David Bentley Hart basically says on his blog, I'm a perennialist now. For all intents and purposes, I can say I'm orthodox, but I'm pretty much a perennialist. That's because of the very confusions that we're talking about. So this, this, what this does is it's a tool. It's not about ideologies. It's a tool 
to take people into ecumenism. It's a geopolitical tool beyond all this stuff. Yeah, that's an interesting take. I see how you can... I use the word ecumenical. I don't know how um, you'd use it in this context, but... um, Yeah, does I mean, any of that produce fruit? Does any of that produce fruit? Kind of global world order, certainly, that's true. Well, I'm but, saying the Neoplatonic structure in Originism is utilized by ecumenists at St. Vladimir Seminary, at Fordham. They're all ecumenists, and they really like Origin because he's amenable to that. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely aware that David Bentley Hart loves Origin. Well, they all do because yeah. it's originism is Neoplatonism, okay, with a veneer of Christianity. It's like, okay, there's Christianity, but the real Christianity is what I'm telling you. And if you read the four page condemnation at the Sixth Council, it's called the Confession of St. Sophronius. It was a four page condemnation that the Council accepts, explaining the entire system of origin. And it says that when, or, for example, it says that when origin posits that the creation of Adam and Eve in the garden is really a myth about the Neoplatonic fall into having bodies. They said that is a ridiculous pagan myth. Okay. And when we read Origen's first principles, right, he's the one that first defines absolute divine simplicity. He uses the Neoplatonic definition of what God's d- uh, divinity is in terms of simplicity. And it's repeated by uh, Augustine. So, and I'm not saying that Origen, uh, it's because they're getting it from Neoplatonism. It's not Augustine wasn't getting it from Origen, but I'm saying that the definition is the same because they have different and erroneous triadic models. Origen's triadic yeah. model is based on Neoplatonism. Okay. I mean, and so, it was a Greek. Yeah. Okay, but that's not the Orthodox Church's Trinity model. You understand? Right. That's not what's yeah, accepted not. at Constantinople one. And so just because they're in other words, we wouldn't accept the speculations of Nyssa any more than we would accept the speculations of Augustine when the church later has a you know big theological council which says, no, we can't accept this. And that's why if you look at the Sunday of Orthodoxy, a lot of the church doesn't do it, but you have appended to it the, uh, the, the uh, Synodicon. And the Synodicon explicitly rejects origin as well. So Platonism is rejected. Aristotelianism is rejected. Uh, rejected. Uh, originism is explicitly rejected. So, you know, if you want to be an originist or a Neoplatonist, people can go do that in their, you know, perennialist circles. It's not the Orthodox Church, though. Gotcha. By the way, uh, Maximus got things wrong, too. Maximus thinks, and I think yeah, this... I, Maximus definitely had some some inclinations toward that as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. Clement of Alexandria, that whole, that whole... Well, hold on, hold on. Let's be clear here. Strange. Let's be clear here because the two, the Ambigua, two books he wrote, mainly going against Originism and his Origins Universalism, but also uh, areas where he takes on difficulties in Nyssa. And one of the places where Origin also, I mean, excuse me, where uh, Maximus, I think, is still even wrong is that he believes that Gender is a result of the fall. So men and women are a result. I don't think that's right. I think that that's contrary to what the narrative of Genesis says. So even Maximus can be wrong about things. So we don't pick and choose out of the church fathers, right? We have the consensus of the church fathers. And then over time, we have to submit to the church. And so if the church in councils five, six, and seven, and then the Synodicon of the seventh, it's really explicit that we can't be uh, originistic apocatastasis believers so forgive me for my ignorance here but in the orthodox perspective you can have spiritual fatherhood you can have spiritual leadership but ultimately if there's an ecumenical council it's going to take precedent over absolutely speculation and i mean does that go indefinitely i mean is there a certain point where you're like oh that that part of the church is good because there's parts of the orthodox church that don't they aren't in communion with each other now and so does the string go all the way down to today? And I know you would say it would, but how do you, how do you pick the right strain, I guess is what I'm asking. Well, so 
the church in history has had many times when various patriarchates and bishops were out of communion with others. So that is a canonical stage in discipline. It doesn't necessarily mean that the theology is different, right? So uh, that comes at a certain point when there's mutual excommunication, and then the churches don't recognize one another. So just being out of communion with one another is just a stage of canonical discipline. And sometimes, you know, that's reconciled. Like we just had the, I think the, the Macedonian schism, which lasted for a good while, was just recently reconciled. Um, but other times it's not reconciled. So, uh, and then eventually the churches part ways. So time has a lot to do with vindicating and, and making it clear who is right and who is wrong. Um, so that's one element to this, which is a version of reception. And I don't care whether you're Roman Catholic or Orthodox. Uh, I mean, the, everybody's going to have to have some idea of that receptionism over time. So for the Roman Catholics, it's right, like, well, is it this Pope or that Pope? Well, time will tell or this council will tell, which is ironic because, right, the Council of Constance is determining the, the, the right Pope when there's rival Popes. But um, anyway, um, so, so hold on. So, so that that's just okay. one element as to in his in history how the church recognizes it. But there's no way to know. I mean, it depends on what kind of a division we're talking about. If we're talking about like disputes over jurisdictions, that's not the same thing as disputes over uh, dogma and theology. That's a little more serious, right? So, right. so in the church, Orthodox is considered an historian, right? What's that? I, Say what? Isn't the, isn't the Armenian Orthodox Church considered an historian by most? No, they're monophysite, not an historian. It's the opposite. Sorry, what was that? They are considered monophysite, not an historian. That's the opposite oh, of Nestorianism. Yeah, right, right, right. But something like that is pretty fundamental. And so there's these branches of the Orthodox Church that split off. They're not branches. Also the same way that... There's, there's no branches in the Orthodox Church. Okay, they're different. They're different... Different... Areas. Okay. The Orthodox the Church, Orthodoxy. the Orthodox Church is a canonical body of people who uh, have uh, patriarchates that they submit to autocephalous churches in communion with one another, and their their boundaries are determined by uh, by canon law and what who who accepts and is in communion with who. So that's the canonical Orthodox Church. The canonical Orthodox Church is not what you're calling the Armenians or the Coptics. That's a different group. That's not part of our group. What is your posture toward them? That they're they are in schism. They are not Orthodox schism. churches. Correct. Gotcha. I mean, they hold to heresies too, but so so the the Orthodox Church is a singular body. It's a we believe that we are the one true church. So that's different from. Just because the uh, Coptics have the name Orthodox doesn't mean anything. Just like Roman Catholics have the name Catholic. Well, we we believe we're the the Orthodox Catholic Church. So, right. Good questions, though. Uh, just stick stick to it. Uh, I would say check out the book, um, uh, the Confession of Saint Sophronius uh, from the Sixth Council, and that you can get that on uh, Amazon. I would also get uh, Maximus is Ambigua because he goes into critiquing origin and originism. Um, and really, if you get into the nature person distinction, if we lay out exactly what the nature person distinction is, really a lot of that stuff with Nyssa uh, or David Bentley Hart, it all gets kind of cleared up because confusing nature and person, not just in God, but confusing nature and person in anthropology is the source of, for example, David Bentley Hart's mistake. Militant Thomas, what's up, dude? Just hit unmute. mute. <clears throat> Are you there? Militant Thomas, are you there? You have the floor, dog. Where you at? Uh, 
I, re- I want you to speak, so but I don't know why I can't hear you. So maybe try coming out and coming back in, see if that works. Uh, you might have to turn. Let's try again here. Try now. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can kind. Of, I can kind of hear you. Okay, I can hear you now. For some reason, I can hear. I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, good. Well, uh, well, Jay, uh, you you know I I can uh, I can debunk you really hard right now. You know, you know how? How's that? Well, uh, it's it's because you're you're uncharitable and, and you're unnuanced. Oh man! And you give rash judgments all the time, Jay. You know that? Do I need to engage in public repentance? Uh, Dude, you, you need to you need to go like full on like medieval penitentiaries. Flagellant, like, flagellant. Roll over glass, walk on your knees. <laughs> if I roll over glass in my knees and I flagellate myself with a cat of nine tails whip, uh, is that enough repentance for you, Michael Lofton, or do I need more? No, no, you got you got to get some Pachamama too in there. Okay, okay. <laughs> Well, Pachamama is basically Mary because they're both women, so I guess it's the same thing, right? That's that's true. That's a good point, Jay. Uh, or when when are you uh, when are you joining the church? When I finish the public penance uh, with the cat of nine tails, so I got to do that first, and then. Uh, okay. Uh... You there? Hello. You roboted there. Are you there? Try again if you want to maybe come out and come back in because I imagine you you have a point you want to make. You can have the floor. You can make whatever point you want to make. We allow the opponents to speak around here. We're not afraid of letting the opponent speak. Are you there? Try coming out and coming back in again because there's not any sound and then I'll give you the mic. Can you hear me? You must be on the road or something. Just come right back in and I'll give you the mic. Let's see. Uh, let's try one more person while he's doing that. Lumvia. Lumvia. Thank you guys for those super chats. We'll get to some of those here in a second. Lumvia, what's up? Hey, how's it going? Hey, what's on your mind? I was actually, I was actually a uh, Christian for a while. I was Catholic and then um i slowly went into uh buddhism but then i kind of went uh even further just to seeing like philosophy in itself and i realized um christianity to me seems like i guess the word for the the kind of word they used at the time was an allegoresis where religious stories whether like whatever religion it is takes philosophy and kind of um, puts it into like a packet or like a metaphor where they take philosophy and kind of condense it into a story. And it kind of, um, I, I did a lot of uh, analysis on the, uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament and how they, um, they were created and they kind of, uh, it's kind of like I could see the nuggets of wisdom in there, but I don't actually believe they literally happened, but they can kind of, um, it's kind of like for most people to under, rather than most people taking whole philosophy courses, the, the, the stories can help kind of give them an idea. Okay. So they're just like mythical, uh, self-help stories or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Where it's kind of like, and it's kind of like based on Plato's idea of the noble lie, where I actually take a mythicist position where I, I don't think you could ever prove it, but I think with all the, uh, how all the documents developed, like the gospels and how each, how they, how they changed and were edited over time, I think it makes more sense for like the evolution of the ideas that, Jesus and also Buddha were most likely just made up to be like a role model to kind of be like a character in the story that represents the writer's 
philosophy and morality and puts it into practice for okay. the the yeah, so, people to demonstrate. Okay, so they're fables. To, like, I, yeah. a, I got it. So they're, they're fables. Okay, so what is the real, true philosophy or worldview that we should believe? What's what's your view? What's your worldview? So the Bible's not true. So what what should we believe? It's um, it like to actually explain it would be, you know, it's kind of like okay. So it's words. it's too it's, it's too deep for like, us. I got it. It's, it's kind of like it's too deep for us. I know we're low IQ. It's I got it. Like, we're, we're low IQ. It's no, too deep. But no, what? Not really. Not really low IQ, but more like it's kind of like it's kind of like essence and energies where each. It, I might butcher the idea, but it's kind of like no one can know God's essence, right? But that's what each religion is trying to explain. So each religion trying to, they try, whatever you write down, it's going to fall short of whatever's like actually there. Oh, right? so, so, so whatever, whatever's okay. written down. So if I wrote down, of, so if I wrote down what you just said, the last three sentences, uh, does it, it doesn't work anymore? Well, even what I say, it's like no matter what words you use, it's I'm like even what I'm saying, it's like how to approach it is through there's like a method where you learn more. It's kind of like a limit function in calculus, right? Where it's like you approach a better understanding of it the more you learn about it, but you the words you use will never accurately okay, describe so it's got, it, yeah it's got as eastern the limit, as the limit approaches infinity you get a better and better approximation mm-hmm. of what i'm talking about okay so but it will ne- it will always the words i'm using will never accurately describe it but you, through a method of intellectual exhaustion you could get closer and closer to getting a better picture of what it actually is okay so how do how do we know that we're actually approximating any anything quote closer given what you said about the words not matching up to this infinite thing how do we know we're getting closer to anything well through the uh through a process of elimination you could um just like show all so you're talking about like kind of, uh, apophatic like the via negativa you're saying do we do that with mathematics or something what how do we know that that's telling us about god what 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 is it there's not a god or what is it just an infinite thusness i mean what are we talking about well there like i'm, I'm trying to like condense so much information so i know i got it so you're yeah. but, but is there an argument so that you, what's the argument for this, this position there's this there's this uh, concept both in greek and uh dharmic thought called the the tetralemma where it's like god or the one or whatever you want to call it is beyond these four statements or I'm not sure what to call them like logical states where the, the four states are God exists, God does not exist God both exists and does not exist okay. and God neither exists nor not exists and God is beyond all four of those okay. where it's so, kind of like um, it's kind of like better describing how god is both everywhere and nowhere like he's outside of existence but all through existence so in kind of a way like the words themselves are kind of pointless right where you could say god is outside of existence which is the same thing as saying he doesn't exist or god is no all of it's existence, not no, everything you're saying like, uh, everything you're saying is garbage yeah, like, uh, no you, could, you can prove it wrong no right, matter what if you're not all right, you rambling kind of ram- like, all right so now it's all garbled nonsense i apologize but that's not going to go anywhere so uh, if we can't make positive predicates and everything is just garbled nonsense and everything cancels out everything then everything that you were saying cancels itself out uh what's up uh militant thomist Can you hit, um, try to talk now? You there? I guess you can keep trying. We'll, we'll, uh, move on to Jack Victor. What's up, Jack? Uh, 
Hi, Jay. What's up? How you doing, Jack? Um, well, I'm a lost son of evangelicalism. And once I red pilled on just the total dishonesty of Protestantism, I want nothing to do with 99% of them. But I'm not so sure that orthodoxy is meaningfully that different. Um, so here's my question. Um, all of these 11 people seem to agree on one thing. Jesus, the Apostle Paul, Tertullian, Justin Martyr, Hermas, Origen, Arrhenius, Clement, Cyprian, Athenagoras, and Theophilus of Antioch. They all agree that a woman who gets remarried while her husband is alive is committing adultery. So help me understand the orthodox position on how they justify remarrying women whose husbands are still alive. Okay, well, first of all, it wouldn't matter what Tertullian says because Tertullian ended up a heretic, so I don't really think he's that relevant. Um, we don't accept all the documents that you listed. There's a lot of things that some uh, of the apologists in the first and second century believe that nobody ends up believing. So just because we can kind of find differing views at different times, I mean, for example, some of those people at that time believed that if you were a traitor or if you had surrendered the scriptures under persecution, you could never be saved. So some of those people thought there were certain sins that you could never repent from and never receive forgiveness from. Now, when it comes to the specific issue of uh, what's allowable, first of all, the Orthodox Church doesn't promote or allow, quote, divorce. It does, in certain cases, for the issue of fornication, allow a, a woman or a man to remarry because of what Christ said in the case of fornication. And so the canons of St. Basil, for example, allow for that. And those were normative in the East for centuries. And so even the Roman Catholic Church... When was the canon of St. Basil? Uh, it would be in the days of Basil. So that would be in the 300s. So in other words, what I'm getting at is that you can cite individual church fathers, just like that guy was citing Nyssa. But, but you would agree it's, it's kind of the overwhelming number of church fathers including it, no jesus it's not and the apostle paul no it's not jesus just by the way jesus says that uh except for fornication so the orthodox church interprets that as that and fornication is also a reason why you can remarry and it's but i think i think one thing that you know that, that when jesus makes that exemption and i think this is what all of these church fathers would also echo is that he was only making that, you know, Jesus is using, you know, we have, in most of the passages, there's only one exemption in, I think in Matthew 19 where it says, okay, except for um, Pornea, mm -hmm. but he's specifically addressing men in that, in that statement. He's not ever permitting women to remarry. In fact, when he makes Jesus four times in three different Gospels explicitly says a, a divorced woman who gets remarried commits adultery. So it seems to me you have to kind of eliminate the gender. So wait a minute. Why? Why? <laughs> wait. Why would he? Ex why would that only be for one of the genders? Well, because we because Jesus all the passages in the New Testament that talk about divorce and remarriage use very explicit gendered language to describe it. They say this is the role of men and this is the role of women. They make that distinction because there is a hierarchy within the marriage. I think it's sure. a reflection of, you know, when you see in numbers, I believe 30, it's 30 where, you know, a woman cannot make a vow. She cannot, you know, enter into a binding <clears throat> agreement unless her father or her husband consents to it. Right. So how can a woman then you know, choose to divorce her husband and then enter into a new arrangement when she doesn't, she simply doesn't have that authority to begin with. And I think the, even the early fathers also make that distinction when they are speaking about very often with women, um, who, uh, you know, that, that, that there's a well, distinction between the, hold the, on. The so there's two things here. So you're right in principle there, obviously uh, in the ancient world and the medieval world too, the typically a woman wouldn't have the authority to do those things kind of on her own. But I think that one thing that happens with Canon law and by the way, can the Orthodox church is not operating on the basis of like citing this or that church father. And so when you say that the majority of the church fathers, that's absolutely wrong because the canons are what become normative, not individual church fathers and sort of going through them like a Protestant sort of quote mining. 
when the canons are accepted, the canons that are normative trump all of that because the canons are accepted at the councils, you see. So if it's normative for the bazillion canons to be accepted, that's the norm. Not what did Athenagoras, what did Tatian, what did Justin Martyr, this or that person say. Because again, there's other examples where you could say, well, a lot of, and, and this happened when you had the disputes with the Novationists uh, and, and the sort of what would become the Donatists. Like they made the argument that, well, earlier uh, church fathers were on our side that if you uh, folded under per persecution, you can't be saved. And they would cite, you know, Hebrews 6, that you've tasted the heavenly gift, you can't be saved. So, so that, that rigorous view, which was actually popular at certain times in the first and second century, eventually was ruled canonically to be wrong. So just because something at a certain point in time, even if it is the majority view, let me give another, another example, the death penalty. There are some church fathers that do not agree on the death penalty or whether you could, for example, uh, be a Christian and serve in the military. But when you go to the Council of Nicaea, this question is raised in the canons and the canons of Nicaea say, no, actually you can be a Christian and be in the military despite many first and second and third century church fathers and writers, patristic writers, opining that it's absolutely impossible to kill and be a Christian. So you see how it doesn't really work to just say, well... well I mean, but to me, it's when, when you look at just the statements of both Jesus and Paul, you know, Paul says twice, a woman is legally bound as long as her husband is alive. These are very clear statements. And also that we don't really have any church, early church fathers at all who are making statements in support of women getting remarried while their husbands are alive. It seems to me it's just a pragmatic institutional decision way down the line. Yeah, and, I, and again, I understand that at certain time like in the ancient world right it wasn't there weren't as many equalitarian notions i understand that but not even the ancient world it's actually but, just in the old within the, the old testament law it was very okay really but the church is the, the, so this is a principle of economia which every council when you read the councils they talk about how the law is to be interpreted so just like the Jews had uh, rabbinical courts, right? And the rabbinical courts would make decisions on these kinds of issues. The church adopted a very similar model where the church has synods and then the synods basically interpret and enforce the laws and the rules. So it's not just a matter of, I'm going to go back and read what the canons say, or I'm going to go back and read what the Old Testament, uh, you know, Levitical law said, and then I'll apply that based on like my modern Protestant presuppositions. The church always had the authority at the local level to interpret and enforce the canons. Now, that doesn't mean they always did it faithfully. Sometimes they messed up. Sometimes the church made error in, for, in certain regions. Certain places were wrong. But what I'm getting at is that it's not a matter of you deciding that, well, Paul says this, and so I'm going to interpret it that way. The church interprets the canons and applies them as the church sees fit to those situations. And that's why Jesus set up an, a, a, a body that has authority. That's what the apostolic deposit has as, a, as the apostolic succession, right? It's like, it's not just a uh, Protestant, like, abstract doctrines it's a body of people like the rabbinical sages who would interpret and enforce the law the church has that same model of interpreting and enforcing the law yeah we have the institutional authority so what we say our canons you know we get together no it's not so yeah so well, you're we, just back we, to we more protestantism like the protestants get together with the westminster confession we have a cabal of politicians and religious leaders yeah it's not a cabal so did jesus say that he would lay down uh, a, a body that he would establish a body of people or not he says that he that hears you hears me so there's a normative authority so you're just likening the the orthodox church to any other church and saying well you're just a cabal well jesus said that the holy spirit would guide and lead the church into all truth so when did the church in your when, in your view when did the Holy Spirit leave the church? Um, I I don't believe that the church is represented in any particular human institution. Okay, well, the church is not a human institution; it's a theanthropic institution. Um, I, I think that the, the church is a collection of individuals who are regenerate and you know re, you know have the Holy oh, Spirit. So, and who is that? Who who is that? Uh, is that the same church that put the Bible together? Um, the men who had the Holy 
Spirit. Uh, how do well, how Spirit. do you know who has the Holy Spirit? Um, there's no public. Only God can ultimately say. Okay, so but there's no public way to adjudicate between rival Holy Spirit claims. I think that individual men who are who have faith in Jesus Christ can make assessments about. Okay, so a Mormon faith. says that a Mormon says I'm an individual who has faith in Jesus Christ. Does he participate in your true church? participate he, he can he can he can go wherever the if he has the holy spirit okay so now i can be I'm an anti-trinitarian i can be a mormon anti-trinitarian and i have the holy spirit so you are hung up on this weird thing to do with like divorce but in your view mormons are acceptable so the trinity doesn't even matter no i, well, no, I, I didn't say that at all you did say um, that you said that he can go where the holy spirit leads so a, Mor yeah, a mormon no, no, is part no, of the church i know I, I, I caveat it to say if, if he does have the Holy Spirit. How I, could a Mormon have the Holy Spirit when a Mormon is an anti-Trinitarian? Yeah, I, I don't... Well, I... I so I'm you... Right now, I'm kind of looking more towards um, Anabaptism. And I think oh, okay. That, so, I mean, so that, yeah, then that would make sense with your heresy because you said that the you basically it would require the church blacking out. So the Anabaptist, the Anabaptist theology I mean, believes that the church blacked out. The church has always existed. Um, okay, where was it? Okay, where was it in the fourth century? Um, in individuals who were. Oh, and where are it? So you're just yeah, you don't have any examples of people who believe that. You, so it's just theoretic. When Jesus, when Jesus entered the world. Uh, I'm not asking really about what you think the gospel said. Mm -mm. Right. I want to know about the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th century. Where were your true Christians there? Give me an example of one. What group? Anybody? Where? Why does it have to be an institutional group? Because Jesus said that there's one, that Paul says there's one Lord, one faith, one body. The church is his body. Is, is Jesus' body invisible? Okay, well, did he have a Did he have a visible body or an invisible body? Does not say it's a it's an institution. It is an institution. And that's a human institution that you can. It's it's a divine a human institution. It's a divine human institution. It's the very institution that the apostles set up. Paul said he laid hands on Timothy, and that Timothy would pass the Holy well, Spirit. You're, you're not. You're not. If you're not going to listen, if you're going to keep interrupting, didn't Paul say that he would lay hands on Timothy, and he told Timothy to put, lay hands on people after him and to pass on the gift of the Holy Spirit? Is that not a historical visible institution? The church at Ephesus where Timothy was a bishop? I think my understanding of that early church is... What does that, that passage mean? I specifically was, gave you a passage. Wasn't, there was... My understanding is that there wasn't necessarily it was more of a brotherhood with the apostles okay so you're not going to answer the specific passages exactly all right goodbye go ahead militant thomas okay is it, fi is it finally yeah i can hear you go ahead okay good good so i was originally going to ask uh, something about Damascene's dialectica, but I actually thought of something more interesting to ask you because I've been wondering this myself. So, how does uh, the issue of the canon of scripture uh, work within orthodoxy? Because, I mean, there's, there's obviously uh, some claims you get from Catholics that uh, orthodox are debunked because, uh, you know, uh, we, we had the super based uh, Council of Trent, which was able to define our canon for us, and, you know, the, the cringe ortho bros, uh, they have they have no uh, ability to make a canon or anything and uh, cry and go to Rome and, and so on. So when, when it comes to the canon of scripture within orthodoxy, like how, how do you how do you view that? Because from my understanding, um, there there's some orthodox thinkers who uh, restrict the canon. Some who have like a tiered sort of system and then some that basically uh, have an almost identical canon as we do. Yeah, so the Orthodox canon, I would say, is confirmed in the ecumenical councils that, for example, Trollo, even though it's not technically ecumenical council, it was received in its canons uh, at the 6th and 7th council. So when Nicaea too, you know, when it confirms the canons of Carthage through Trollo, so Trollo says we accept uh, these specific, not every Carthage canon, but 
it's the same canon as uh, the, the Catholic Church for the most part. Now, there's some churches who have historically translated and included like Third Esdras and the Slavic canon or something like that. Um, but it, to us, it's not that big of a deal. Like, it's not like we can't have an extra book here or there because the canon for us is there, there's flexibility in that because it's 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 a liturgical document and the history of the, the church is always kind of flex, flexible on those kinds of things. So uh, the highest council, the highest authority for us is the council. So when uh, the seventh council affirms Trello, that would include the deuterocanonical text. But there is a there is a hierarchy within the liturgy itself. I mean, Paul's epistles are read and then they're not given the honor in the liturgy that the gospels are given. So the gospels are given a higher authority even authority of honor right i'm not saying that that means that the rest of the texts are not inspired or whatever because i mean the deuterocanonical texts are are part of the canon yeah yeah how would how would this fit in with um the apocalypse of saint john because from my understanding that was a little bit uh shakier in the east there for a while uh due to um, the fact that it wasn't read as much in the liturgy yeah, it's, it's cited in one of the uh, one of the daily readings, but there, I don't think there's any reason why we wouldn't include it in the canon. It's Saint Athanasius is who convinced Rome to include it in the canon. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you, do you want, uh, can I also ask uh, sure. about the dialectica? Ask whatever you want. Or, or, yeah, whatever you want. Yeah. So with the uh, with the dialectica of, of Saint John Damascene, I've been I've actually been reading through Saint John of Damascus's works. I want to read through Maximus. After that, I've only read limited readings from Maximus. But uh, with with Damascene uh, in the dialectica, uh, he's obviously like presenting some sort of like uh, beginning uh, instruction uh, in philosophy uh, as it's necessary for theology. And he does a lot of uh, interesting quoting uh, from the peripatetic uh, yes. commentators yes. Uh, on like Ammonius uh, doing that uh when it when it comes to like what he's teaching in philosophy how does how does that kind of fit in with uh sort of your vision of how philosophy has been received in the orthodox church and is it would it be appropriate for orthodox to read some of those peripatetic commentators to get an idea of philosophy yeah i think if you look at zach huber's recent book like he talks a lot about uh by the time of max about excuse me by the time of maximus and john damascus uh aristotle was a lot more available and so aristotelianism became a lot more natural uh and i think you could argue that damascene is a lot more aristotelian than he is neoplatonic cappadocians have more influence from neoplatonic and platonic philosophy than aristotle obviously damascene has more aristotelian influence and so i would say that yeah in fact uh i did a lecture through the fount of knowledge um i think six years ago because i think orthodoxy should be familiar with those topics absolutely okay okay thank you that's all i had yeah good questions thank you for that uh let's see pine augustine what's up dude Welcome, everybody. If you would, uh, hit like and share. We are opening it up to questions, answers, disputes, disagreements. You can raise your questions. And you can use your Super Chats right there. Do your Super Chats. Uh, Did you want to unmute Hein Augustine? You got the mic, dog. Unmute. Okay. If you're not going to unmute, then we'll move on. Uh, near, well then everybody's just dropping off as soon as I'm about to go to him. Zen, did you want to speak? You've been waiting a while. Zen. Uh, hello, Jay. Yes, sir. I got a question about um, natural theology. Okay. Sorry if fans in the background that can't turn them off um so uh i was wondering if we can argue whether god exists and if it's the orthodox christian god specifically um by arguing for the existence of like certain universal truths such as laws of logic free will morals or truth itself uh would that be natural theology or something like along the lines of a transcendental 
No. Right. So natural theology is defined specifically as uh, arguing for God's existence without divine revelation. So I would just simply say that, no, the categories that we're talking about here, like uh, truth itself or logic or universals, although they themselves are not necessarily divine revelation, they're grounded in divine revelation by the Logi. So doing argumentation and logic is not natural philosophy or natural theology. And that's something that like Trent didn't understand. I see. All right. Well, thanks for your question. Uh, just I came to Orthodoxy thanks to you. So I oh, just want to say that. Great day. Glory yeah. to God. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Glad to hear that, man. Um, hi, Augustine. Did you want to try again? You got to hit on mute, dog. I mean, God is the Trinity, so how are we going to argue for God's existence that's not the Trinity? I mean, <laughs> this doesn't... Are you there, man? What's up? Hey, Jay, can you hear me? Uh-huh, what's up, man? Oh, no, great. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still going to book some time. You I'm what? Protestant, but I, I first want to read up a bit so I can give you a run for your money. Um, okay. But, uh... I'm working on a documentary on the work movement, and I see you guys have traced it back to, to the Gnostics. Wait, what? So, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. You, Slow I mean, down. Most, most, most of what I've read is that the Dude. Gnostics started out in the Hellenistic world. But, I don't know uh, what you're saying. I was wondering if you guys, you, you came across anything earlier. Like, uh, I don't know what you're talking like, about. Uh, Egyptian Bro, and, uh, slow down. Egyptian. Is there, a, yeah. is there a, a delay? I don't know what you're saying. You're working on a documentary on Gnostics? Yes. Okay. I yes. heard that part. Then what? Slow down a little bit. Uh, okay, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, so, and I, most, most sources trace it back to the Hellenistic world. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was just wondering, because they, they say there are earlier influences like uh, Egyptian, uh, Persian, and these guys. So I was just no wondering problem. if you or uh, James Lindsay, any of you guys came across anything that, that that goes back further because I'm, I'm trying to trace it back to its to its ultimate source, which which might be the Garden of Eden, but uh, you know who knows. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's really. I guess that would get really speculative, and I'm not. You know, I'm not a, a historian of religion. I'm not trained in comparative religion per se. So, I mean, I could just say, look, you know, Plato talks about the mysteries of Platonism go back to Egypt. That's his claim in the Timaeus. Um, I think in one of the other dialogues, it actually says that the mysteries of Platonism are the mysteries of Thoth. So, uh, but whether that's true or not, I don't know. And I understand there's a difference between um, Gnosticism and Platonism, but they clearly have some kind of, you know, common root. So I would guess that Platonism probably has some root in Egypt, as does Gnosticism. So, but, but as to what's older than that, I don't know. Okay, because they they seem like the same different streams of the same river. I mean, Hermeticism, Gnosticism. There's a lot of similarities between mm -hmm. them, so I think there's there's something something similar to them. But uh, yeah, well. those are great questions. Yeah, um, yeah, I think a lot of stuff in like the you know the ancient ancient world. You know, lots a lot of speculation, so it's a lot of stuff we don't know. Um, we got a lot of people here uh, lined up. I recognize some of these names, and I'm a little, I'm like, I don't know. Is this one of our, uh... I feel like I've heard this name before. Order of Things, didn't we talk? Hello? Yep. We've talked, haven't we? What would you argue? I don't remember. Go ahead. Are you there? All right. Nico, what's up, Nico? Nico House, what's up? I'm you, dude. Hello? Yeah, what's up, man? Gee, no way. So big fan. Um, 
So I'm going to challenge you on that. You are a pagan. Okay, sure. And it's, it's, so I looked up the etymology of the word, and it says a person of non-Christian or non-Jewish faith. And in Latin, it's villager, citizen, non-combatant. So of the country or of the village. So I ask you, are you an American citizen? Yeah. So you are of a country. Sure. So you are a pagan. Uh, that sounds like a fallacy. So it's just the origin of the word. All right. Good job, dude. You wait. You waited that long. You waited that long to say something that dumb. Good job, Dawkins. What's up, dude? AJ. Um, yes, sir. So I actually want to push back on uh, something that okay. I do. I know you're a young earth creationist, and this is going to be kind of my, my argument against you. Okay. Um, so I'm an old earth creationist, um, and I, I would like to know what you think of the idea of the earth being old on the basis of um, the speed of light, basically. Because I, I heard that argument that the... Um, the Earth is essentially like 4.5 billion years old, and they calculate it on the basis of essentially the speed of light, like how far light travels to a certain to a certain distance. So, like, yeah, but I that's just, just a, that's just that a, that's just assuming the Earth could be like 6,000 years old based on that. Yeah, um, yeah, I just don't. I, I think that's a highly speculative um, basis for an argument. So the it's the assumption is that. Oh, you know, it took the light, you know, however many million years to get here. So therefore, uh, from the Big Bang, right, like everything expanding out, it would have taken. I mean, God could place the, you know, stellar luminaries there and the light already be here. Right. And furthermore, I mean, we don't actually know that there the the other planets and galaxies are you know, zillions of light years away. That's all just assumed. There's not any real way to prove. But wait a minute. We do actually know this um, because it's actually been scientifically observed um, that we, and it's actually, it's actually been scientifically observed that light does travel at a certain It's only, but that's based on a certain period to actually get to from one point to the other. But that's based on the assumption that the measurements are that everything operated in the same way that it always has. Right. So like, the uniformity of nature has to be assumed such that the light always traveled at that same speed or that, and none of that's provable, right? So it's, it's based on assumptions that are not actually demonstrable. How do you prove that it always All operated right. that but way? How do you, how do you know that's not accurate? Because I can, because there's actual, there's actually scientific measurements that have been proven that yes, light travels at a no, certain No, no, no. That's not what I said. Speed. That's not what I so said. Like, that's not what I me, said. Like, as that's not what I said. Like, I said, how do you know that it operated in a uniform, even if that is the case, how do you know that it operated in a uniform way all the way back into the aeons of the Big Bang or whatever? Because, I mean, the, the Big Bang has been scientifically proven, like, based on cosmic background radiation waves. So, like, um, for, so like for me, as someone who... Yeah, did you not hear what I just asked you? You didn't hear what you didn't hear what I just asked you. I said, "How do you know and the, the uniformity of nature how, that it was that it was uniform billions of years ago?" Um, what, what do you mean? How do I know yeah, based yeah. on uniformity of nature? I mean, it's a mathematic equation. Yeah. So again, not going to answer the question. It's a very specific question about the principle of uniformity that nature operated in a uniform way all the way back into aeons past. So if you're not going to answer that question and you're just going to keep blowing past it, you just keep saying, no, it's scientifically proven. It's scientifically proven. I asked a specific question about the principle of uniformity operating in the distant past. How do you know that? Maybe it's true, but what you replied with does not answer the question that I asked you. Ex-Muslims. Um, hi, thanks for letting me speak. Um, although I'm an atheist, I do agree with Jay on this. On what? That, on that science assumes uniformitarianism. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, 
So how do we prove I that? Think, but I think, like, from a philosophical point of view, simplicity is always better. And that doesn't that um, doesn't prove anything. Easier. That's not a proof. <laughs> that's a principle that may or may not be useful to what we're talking about. It doesn't prove anything. Um, it depends on what you mean by proof. I yeah, don't sure. Think exactly. Anything can be one hundred percent demonstrated, but it's rational in the sense that it's probable. Okay. Yeah, none of these answers are at all getting at the question that I asked. Uh, so we have T free, the guy who said that he's got a much higher IQ than me. What's up, dude? Put me in my place. Unmute. Unmute. You got a you got a two hundred IQ. You're not unmute, right? Bro, you said that you were forty points higher than me in IQ, and you can't unmute. I sent you the link, dude. What's up? Hello. Can you hear me, Jay? Yeah, you got a Jay. 40 points Jay. higher IQ. Go ahead. Jay. Hey, don't do don't repeat my name. Whatever you want, sir. Don't do this. I'm not trying to be dis disrespectful. I'm kind of retarded. Like dude, don't, don't lie to me. You told me, I, you said I'm a dick, and then you're like, well, I'm not trying to be you disrespectful. To How am I a dick? And you, you're, you're, you're trying to steal my hair, by the way, too. How am I a dick? What do you mean? Well, I mean... No, to be honest, you just the last few men that you've been speaking with, they're kind of tired, you know, so you got to dumb it down a little bit. And your intelligence is um, hard to intercept for for the lower of the, uh, you know, the prime. Okay, well, you, you're a Mensa species. man. Yeah, you're a Mensa man. So you can intel you can enlighten us. So go ahead. Yes, yeah, sir. I'm just saying that the things that you say sometimes are really mean to not only yourself but others around you you really mean uh -huh. are very smart and you do the same thing that i do sir and what's okay. that I, I my problem is is that i hate on people constantly for not being able to keep up if you would like to um, pause and put a pin on that subject of me thinking you're a dick, i'm not hating on people so i don't know what you're talking about no, you do. You constantly hit on people that are stupid. Well, and how am I hating on people? YouTube I don't know cats. what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, no, you're a little bit mean to, to um, the crazy leftists, which they need to be saved by Jesus. Okay. You know, yes, yes, sir. I'm, I'm not trying to like hate on you at all by any means. I'm just trying to do as our father wishes us to do. And I'm all saying right. that that's really pious. Okay. So where do you disagree? What, what uh, argument would you like to present? Uh, no, 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 no. That's what I would like you to present to me. I don't, uh, like I said, in, in, in all of my chats, is I, I don't find many things we'll dig upon. Um, but I would love to debate you on any topic from Jesus, God, aliens, anything, whatever you want. And it's more. Okay, well, I don't engage. Of, uh, oh, hold on. So, hold on. So, I don't. I don't engage in debates just to debate. So, I only debate the positions that I actually hold. So I want to know, I have like a lot of hold uh, um, of, of, of these positions. Okay, I got it. Jesus, so, aliens, God. Uh, we could start on aliens. Okay, if you'd like. so you're really smart. So tell me where you think I'm wrong. Oh uh, no, that's uh, first and foremost. If you look back to the message, I said that there's a lot of things that I don't think we'll disagree upon. I just think you're kind okay, of okay. So tell me where you do disagree. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, you cut out. So tell me where you do disagree. The only times you're you're mean to stupid people. Yeah. I think that Jesus said, "No, no, literally, bro, you're on on point with ninety nine point nine nine percent of everything that God and and the Orthodox Church wants from us, uh, except that the, the love and kindness just seeps from you." So how is it loving and lo how is it loving kindness mean. to tell me that I'm a dick and you're so much smarter than me? That sounds like you're just trolling. So this is not a no, serious person. No, 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 no. I mean, I could show you my mentor. I don't care about your Mensa card, dude. Good grief, man. Unbelievable. What, dude? Go ahead. Dawkin, go ahead.
Yeah, what about it? Oh, um, okay, so I, I feel like you kind of brushed my argument off when it came to the age of the earth. I so asked you a I'm specific question you. about what the argument presupposed, and you blew past it, wouldn't answer it. That's why I booted you. Um, well, can I can I speak and present an argument? Avery, uh, hold on a second. Hey, Jay, uh, I apologize for interrupting you guys. I actually just, uh, I'm, I'm his buddy. I actually just wanted to say I really do admire your work, and I, kind of, and I love your debates, man. Big fan. Sorry, Abe, i got to be a little biased, but... <laughs> Um, uh, you know, keep killing it. And by the way, I'm getting into your introductions on Genesis soon. So once I, uh, uh, once I finish that and Exodus, I'm going to start watching, uh, okay. your videos explaining it. Cause, right. uh, it's awesome. Okay. Um, so but- I asked you about the principle of uniformity, uniformitarianism, that that underlies your argument. And it doesn't matter okay. which one you pick. The light argument, the uh, radioactive decay argument. Yes, it's- that's another argument I was going to bring up is the radioactive decay argument. Um, yeah, so for that to work, that's a very strong argument because for that to work, listen, dude, for that to work, you're gonna have to demonstrate the principle of uniformitarianism. So just have at it, go for it. Okay, I mean, okay, so the scientific formula is that the is that the rate of decay is you're not gonna, so again, you're not gonna address the question I asked you. I am, I'm trying to, no, you're not. Do you even understand the question? question? Good god. Dude, Bro, don't you don't, just to, listen, I'm man. To don't follow. And, and like rebut your claims that the Earth is six thousand years old on the basis of this. Are you? Argument. How many beers did you have, dude? Are you? Can you not listen to what I'm asking you? That your argument presupposes uniformitarianism, so it's not going to work until you address that. So just telling me the argument is not addressing the question. Can you? Can you? Can you prove right. that the Earth is six thousand years old? Did you not hear what I asked you? That's a two quote way. I did. I'm asking you to. Do you know, what's a two quote way? What's a two quote way? A two quote way, a two quote way fallacy. Um, yeah. that, that's a fallacy of a restatement of a position. No, it's not. It's against. It's a what aboutism. It's what about you not answering this question? So you're. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, you know what, bro? That's fine. We're done. You don't and don't. You, you can unfollow me. It's fine. Go on. Move on. Uh, Jim, whatever. So I, I put up with this idiocy from people, right? <laughs> and then, oh, you're mean, dude. And I'm a, a 40 IQ points above you Mensa guy. But you're mean, bro. You're mean, dude. Is everybody just yeah. drunk on Friday night? Is that what it is? What's up, Jim? You know, a, a uh, interesting side point for this conversation might be uh, the population of the human race. By all scientific measures only two percent of the population human population existed before the advent of christ crucifixion and resurrection what do you, why do you think that plays into this kind of you know even if the you know it's talking speaking about the age of the earth i hear you guys going on about this like you know, I, I don't understand the question what is uh, uh, so just your perspective on that you know by all, you know, scientific. You I'm know, sorry to get, uh, look, I'm not trying to be rude to you. I'm not, but I don't understand the point of that question. And I'm just, I'm just going to have to, like, I'm starting to get annoyed. People are starting to get on my nerves. And when it gets on my nerves, I start to get sassy, you see. And then that's when people say, oh, he's mean. We got him exposed. He's mean. I don't want to hear your dumb arguments. If you got a good argument and dude, Get out of here, all you like weirdos with your IQ bullshit. <laughs> Order of things. I guess now we know to get like the really ridiculous stuff. We do it on Friday night. Hi, Jay. Yes, sir. Um, I want to talk about pre- um, dialectics. And um, in practice, what really happens is that the parties. Are you drunk? Get- is everyone drunk tonight? No. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> the parties become radicalized in their positions. Okay, what is this? This is not. A, we're not talking about politics, bro. It's theology debate. Right. No, this is this is, this is regarding dialectics and and how they work in practice. Okay. And what happens is the parties become radicalized, and the the progress and so the, the common assumption is that. It's it's a it's a way to find common ground, but actually, what happens is that it's the ideas that become outside the margin 
the radicalized idea become the okay progress. how does this relate to atheism catholicism it's not yes, politics it because in religious debates people radicalize their, their positions and they are sometimes they outside the orthodoxy yeah okay sometimes yeah, and yeah. so the gospel on the other hand or evangelion is has a different posture it's it's a, it's a declarative it's a has a declarative posture not polemical posture Mm, Jesus engages in polemics, so not true. Not right. I mean, I'm not. Let's not get dialectical here. But in primary, I would say it would be it would have its posture would be more declarative than the posture of the Gospels say, is in the context of liturgy. Well, the, the Evangelion is really a proclamation, right? The, the Christ is King. Okay, sorry. Not relevant to what we're talking about, but thank you. Um, Ooh. Agora Square. Unmute. Hey, Jay. How's it going? What's up, man? How are you? Doing well, doing well. Yeah, just a quick question. So, just want to get your, maybe your opinion, or maybe the general uh, consensus, or, well, uh, opinion of the Eastern Orthodox Church because I've heard some different things about this topic. So, uh, how do you guys feel? And maybe give me your your perspective. And I've, like I said, I've heard some different you know perspectives even within the Eastern Orthodox of um, like non Eastern Orthodox apparitions. So, um, like our you know the Coptic apparition of Our Lady of Zaytum in like the sixties. Um, obviously, you know the big Catholic ones, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Fatima. Um, I've heard a lot of Eastern Orthodox specifically being a little sy- sympathetic toward, uh, like the Coptic apparitions, um, which I find kind of strange and confusing. Um, but, um, yeah, just want, would love to maybe get your position. Yeah. I think like that it's very simple. Yeah. The, uh, Pauline stricture is that we don't go by the apparitions. We go by what is divine revelation. And Paul is just restating what's in Deut- Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18, so um, could Mary appear to whoever? Uh, sure, but that has nothing to do with what we're going to do for our praxis and our uh, what we do in terms of normativity, right? So it has nothing to do with what we do. Uh, if you want the specifics, I've done multiple live streams getting into the Cold War structure and situation of a lot of those Marian apparitions and how that's used in the Cold War for psychological operations on, on record. So that's part of this. Um, but yeah, I've done, I've done really long live streams on that. Uh, no, I don't accept Fatima or Medjugorje or any of that stuff. And I would not accept. And, and again, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter if Mary appeared here or there, or whatever. It has nothing to do with, the, again, the previous revelation. Uh, yeah, I think I'm lost. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Hello? <sighs> Matt. It's about to, it's getting feisty up in here. What's up, Matt? Hey, how you doing, man? I'm biting my lip. I'm going to try to be nice. I'm going to try. Yeah, man, I, I, I'm I try. feel it. I'm hearing what you're going through, and, uh, and I appreciate it, man. Thanks for letting me speak. Go ahead. Hey, uh, I have a question about so- sodiophotiology. Okay. Uh, as far as the orthodoxy faith is concerned, and your, I'm curious about your position on it. I it was funny. I was invited onto this uh, the spaces by uh, by some orthodox people. I'm not orthodox myself. Um, and one of the, the big sticking points I have is where grace is actually extended to people. I believe I actually yeah, I hadn't known you. I hadn't followed you before this. I think I saw a video of you. Uh, talking about grace extended potentially past the Orthodox uh, Ecclesiastes, and I just wanted to know your position on it. The Orthodox Ecclesiastes. Okay, yeah. So the Orthodox. I guess the Orthodox Church. Yeah. So there's grace outside the church, but that doesn't mean that there's salvation outside the church. So you have to be united to the church in some way. Uh, to be saved. And if God does that in his own way, that's certainly possible. We see that with the thief on the cross. But the normative means by which a person is saved is the Orthodox Church. Right. So I, I guess uh, I guess my question is, where's the line? Well, I mean, we're not told that. So, I mean, how, how could I say, what do, you, what do you mean, where's the line? Like, 
Well, I mean, I guess what I mean is this, is that, like, the grace of God is something that we can't obviously fully comprehend on this side of eternity, right? Mm -hmm. And so, with us, like, a martyr in China who's never had the grace of the Orthodox Church to be able to be bestowed upon them and take sacraments of any kind, they could have authentic salvation, am I correct? Again, that's what I just said, that it's, it's possible for God to unite somebody to the mystical body in his own way. And that's why the church does have, uh, we consider, you know, baptism of blood, baptism of desire. Those people are considered members of the church. But when it comes to people that, that are in those uh, other countries that we don't have, I mean, we don't know that, right? So we know God is a just judge and he's fair and he, we leave that up to him. So all we know is what we're told to do, which is it's our job to tell people to become Orthodox. Okay, so uh, forgive me because you're, you're it's funny when, when you have a, have somebody jump on and speak or it's funny you start to break up on your end it's it's kind of a weird thing uh so i think i heard what you were saying and if i can clarify just a clarifying question so why like like cross-denominational are there a remnant within cross-denominations i don't know what that means a remnant is, is within cross denomination. Is there salvation denomination. within Protestantism? Is there salvation within Catholicism? Is there Protestantism? No. Is there why? No. Because there's one true church, and it's the Orthodox Church. Right. So how does that account for the people that have never had the grace of the church? What I said that the, the God is able through divine through His power to yeah. unite people to the mystical body in His own way. Right. So it's not a, a matter of spatial location. It's a matter of whether or not the the grace of God unites you to the mystical body. The mystical body is the Orthodox Church. So, so is is your stance that salvation exclusively comes through the Orthodox? So, Church? correct. Yes. I, I guess I'm trying to understand. Yes, like, I said yes. How you can like uh, I guess overlay that with what like the mystery of God's grace. So I don't think that the mystery of God's grace contradicts what He has revealed. So he's revealed that there's one true church, and that's the church that put the scriptures together, for example. Okay, and again, clarifying questions more so than anything else. I, I'm, I'm confused about that aspect of things. Well, and let's make this simple. Let me let me clarify it for you. Let me yeah. clarify it for you. So, um, in the sixth, seventh, eighth century, the Orthodox Church put the Bible together, and it's the Bible that you have. So why aren't you in the Orthodox Church if you're using its Bible? Well, I, I don't understand why that would necessarily matter. Because if you're going on missions and giving the Bible, whatever the Bible is, um, uh, with well, a, because it's assuming know, that uh, there's so much background noise, I can't. Like that, you're that out. Can, hey, can you I'm call? Going out. All right. Yeah, sorry. Can you call in when there's not so much background noise? It's really hard to hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll move out. Let's, let's try. Let's try. Try coming back or something. It's like I can't get through all this background noise, dude. I don't want to. I don't want to talk to you. Get out of here. Like, why would you think I want to interact with you? It's people acting ridiculous. Artie Lucas. Oh, hi, Jay. Do you hear me? Mm hmm. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, sorry. Just sorry. Right. Just, yes. Uh, so basically, I'm Presbyterian. I'm 22 years old, and I was getting into orthodoxy lately. And I'm curious on the point of iconography. Okay. What's the point of iconography? And is this does this go against a God, Jesus saying that, do not create an image of me to worship? Okay, Jesus, when did Jesus say, don't create an image of me? First of all, Jesus is the icon of the Father, according to Paul uh, in his uh, epistles. And so iconography is based in and rooted in human nature itself, right? We're told in the Garden of Eden that man was made in the icon, the image of God. So iconography is really fundamental to how God communicates and reveals himself to the created order. All divine revelation, if you think about words in the scriptures, they're iconographic, right? They're images. 
And so if there's something fundamentally problematic with images themselves, then the temple would not be full of images. The ark would not have seraphim on it. There would not be angels in the temple everywhere. So no, God is not anti-image. In fact, he's very iconographic. And so the earliest days of the church's worship include all these principles of created things as mediums of grace. And so iconographic worship and iconographic symbology and reality is fundamental to how God relates to the world. And so the icons, for example, are mediums of grace via the divine energies. So they're windows to heaven, we say. And so the Bible being full of imagery, the Bible being full of John seeing into heaven, seeing a vision, the form of God appearing to Isaiah, the form of God, the voice of God speaking to Elijah and Elisha, right? There's a theophanic manifestation, right? There's a form. And that form in the Old Testament is Jesus, is the Logos. And then Jesus takes on a human nature. So he takes on created things, creation, and deifies it by doing so. And so when we go to the earliest church fathers, they talk about the Eucharist as the real presence of Christ because his uncreated divine energy is present there. The medicine of immortality. St. Cyril of Alexandria calls it the, uh, the uncreated energies that deify the flesh to make it the deified flesh. So everything about the worship of the church is iconographic to its to all the way down to like everything in the created order being a manifestation of the logos. So Maximus says that Christ wears all of the created order like a, a, like a vestment. Uh, I guess he dropped off. So I don't know the people coming back that we didn't have a good exchange. So I don't know why you keep coming back in here with these bad exchanges. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Hey, Anderson. How's it going? What's up? Uh, not much. Uh, I had a couple of questions. That's okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so uh, some things I've been thinking about. Yeah, I've been listening to your past few streams and um, the topic about uh, uh, the, and the Catholic system, them having unity and clarity. Um, and uh, but, but really, when it comes down to it, uh, it's not much different than the Protestant system when it comes to basically personal interpretation of, of documents. And I was just wondering to get sort of like your uh, statement and, Jamie? and perspective on how that contrasts to the Eastern Orthodox system and, and and how that's different, you know, and how we know what the true doctrines are and whatnot. And then I also have a couple other questions too. Yeah, so, okay. uh, I mean, I've answered that. I'm not trying to be rude. I've just, I've answered that many, many times in many, many uh, podcasts. Um, so there's two different questions there. One is about individual certitude and assurance. And there's another question of normative authority. So if it's a question of public authority, we would uh, disagree with the Protestants and agree with the Roman Catholic. There is uh, public authority that exists uh, that men have from Christ, right? But when it comes to what that authority is, we believe that authority is what we see in the first thousand years of the church, which is synodal, collegial church government. It's not a, a monarchical system of everybody just asking the Bishop of Rome what the answer is. So, but that's different from the question of, well, how does an individual have certitude? Because every individual person, whether you're Protestant, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, is in the same boat. And there's no way to answer that question other than to say at the, in the final analysis, it's the Holy Spirit that gives us certitude. But again, where we disagree is the means that the Holy Spirit uses. So the means the Holy Spirit uses in the Roman Catholic system is you and the papal documents. The means the Holy Spirit uses in the Orthodox view is uh, you and the entire life of the church, the liturgy, the lives of the saints, the church fathers, the ecumenical councils, the Bible, all of that is a holistic thing, right? So right. Um, obviously the Orthodox view is a holistic view of the individual's experience within the entire life of the church, including all of those elements that you can't, you can't like, like a science experiment, like pick out like one thing that gives you certitude. Because those are all created things that are part of the life of the church. And they're all endued with grace. They're all endued with the divine energies. And so they're all experiences of God. 
There's no super experience of God that the Roman bishop has to the exclusion of any other bishop. That's why the earliest church fathers say that the fullness of Catholicity exists in the local bishop. So there's no super bishop in Rome that has super Catholicism, you see. The fullness of the church, the fullness of the life of the Holy Spirit is in the local church with the local bishop. That's the orthodox view. And so the Protestant view is, uh, well, good luck uh, with you and the Holy Spirit and your Bible. And uh, the Roman Catholic view is, good luck with you reading through the papal documents. Uh, we're doing people who have not called in and who disagree tonight. So, Daniel Griffin looks like he's been waiting a while. Are you there, Daniel? All right. Daniel's not there. Daniel, are you there? Christian preacher and husband. Preacher Daniel, are you there? Where are you at? You've been waiting for all this time. You don't want to speak. Look how mean he is. He's so mean. Colonel Donnelly. Colonel Donnelly. Are you a real colonel? Colonel Sanders, what's up? Yo, what's up, Jay? Love your stuff. Um... One question: um, What does the does the mystical or m mystical experience play any part in the Orthodox Church? Uh, with qualifications and caveats, I mean, like we wouldn't say that the kind of mystical experiences that Eastern religions promote or that uh, Charismatics have is equivalent to or good for uh, us. No, so I mean. Yeah, I mean, we would say that the saints have a mystical union for sure, but it's always within it's always within the context of the church and the sacraments and a spiritual father. It's never like this thing of you going out there and doing a ayahuasca vision quest or something like that. Uh, I, I got you. Uh, is there any like description? Hey, Jamie, that experience or those experiences? Uh, uh, yeah, you could read about the Hesychasts and Saint Gregory Palamas. Jamie, can you turn the air on? It's really uh, hot in here. Do, do you know how they describe it? Is it like a... Yeah, so it's the vision of God. Every... It's described as seeing God, and it surpasses uh, all conceptual understanding. Okay. Cool. It's what Paul yeah, talks it's... about when he talks about being caught up into the third heavens. It's, that's the same. For us, that's the same thing. Um, Matt, did you want to say something now that you're back? Before. Bro, it's still there, but go ahead. Uh, man, hang on. Let me get off the speakerphone then, and I'll, uh, I'll switch it real quick. Two seconds here. I mean, it's gonna. This is gonna go bad, so you don't even have to. I can already All tell right, this no. is. I'm this good. Is I'm good. Go bad. Right there. Bro, it's. Uh, -uh it's even worse. Good. I can already. I can already tell it's gonna go bad anyway. But maybe if I'm. Uh, maybe another time if I'm in a better mood. But. Uh, Daniel Griffin's back. What's up? Pastor Daniel, he's going to put us put us straight. Preach the word of God to us. He's going to set us straight. Hey, AJ, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, right on. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to do any preaching right now. I'm actually uh, I'm a former Reformed Presbyterian. I'm an uh, Orthodox inquirer. Now. Oh. Um, okay. Largely, uh, you, your videos really helped me a lot with that. I just had a, had a kind of a... Um, I just thought of this the other day with because a lot of my family is uh, is still uh, Presbyterian and mm -hmm. uh, they look at you know praying to saints as idolatry and icons as idolatry and all that. Um, I, I'm thinking though, uh, you know, they they also refer to the Bible as the Word of God. And upon you know inquiring into orthodoxy, I'm I'm realizing like no, it's not actually the Word of God is is always Christ. It's always Jesus. Um, so wouldn't calling the Bible the word of God, calling something God when it's not God, wouldn't that be idolatry? No, I think that's fine to you. There is a sense in which we can call the scriptures, the word of God. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it's, uh, 
you know, it's not a mutually exclusive or it's not the only sense, right? I mean, Jesus says in John 5, you know, you search the scriptures because you think that it is in them that you have eternal life and it was they that testify of me. So the scriptures are the word of God in the same way that the natural world is the word of God, right? So Maximus says that the, there's the, one of the reasons that if you read Stan Eloy's volume one of Orthodox Dogmatics, he says that one of the reasons that there's no natural theology in the Orthodox tradition is because there's no fundamental difference between the rev, the content of the revelation in nature and the content of the revelation in scripture. The content of both is the same, which is the logos. And the only difference is the medium, right? Sticks and trees are not identical to the book, but what the sticks and the trees point to is the same thing. That the book points to. So, okay. so everything is a theophanic manifestation of the logos, including the Bible and including sticks and trees. Okay, so it's cool to still call it the word of yeah, God. Yeah, so the word of God in a limited sense, right? But not in the ultimate sense, like the person itself. Or Jesus is the literal living word of God, a divine person, okay. right? So again, John 5, 39. Okay, cool, man. Yeah, thanks. good question. Thanks, uh, thanks for your videos and everything you do, man. It's, Thank you. Uh, it's a joy to, uh, to listen to. Appreciate that. Yeah, God bless you, man. Appreciate that. I thought that was going to get hot and heated. Caboose lube, uh oh, butt lube. I guess this is gonna definitely be high quality. Are you there? Butt lube, are you there? Unmute. All right, so we know what we get on a Friday night. We get butt lube calling in. Okay, sure. Um, Kaiden Jacob. Unmute. <sighs> Unmute. You've been waiting all this time. I don't know. <laughs> People wait for like an hour and then they don't unmute. Okay. Well, we'll just move on. Your Majesty. Uh oh. We got the king. The king is in the house. What's up, your majesty? Yo, what's up, Jake? Yes, sir. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you um, some questions, not necessarily like just debate, just ask you questions. Um, what do you think about Molinism from an Orthodox point of view? Is that accepted in the Orthodox Church or what? Uh, I mean, it's still couched in Protestant dialectics, so I would hesitate from saying that the Orthodox Church is, quote, Molinist. So what would be like the disagreements, let's say? Uh, it's a, it's soteriology is what solves our, you know, crystal, uh, our, uh, excuse me, Christology is what solves our soteriological issues. So it's not a question of, um, you know, the relationship of grace to the individual. It's just a question of the relationship between grace and uh, the human nature in the, t the the two natures of Christ, right? So when the divine person, the Logos, deifies his human nature, that becomes the model for how humans synergize through their natural energy to cooperate with grace. So in a limited sense of like cooperation, I guess you could say Molinism is part of that. Um, and, and I would say that in the specifics of predestination, uh, we don't really get into like individual predestination per se, because in Paul's epistles, for example, predestination is like it's collective and it's in the context of Christology. So Paul's writing a letter to a visible church in Ephesus and he's saying, you are the predestined. It's not writing a letter to the invisible elect. So again, Molinism is still couched within Reformation dialectics and it's just not really addressing the main um uh, shift because there's a different order of theology amongst Protestants as opposed to Orthodox. Got it. Got it. So, um, I had another question when it comes to like Orthodox theology, what would, um, what is the Orthodox view on it? Is it amillennialism or premillennialism or what? I don't think there's one set. Uh, I mean, obviously you can't be premill. I mean, that's rejected, uh, at, mm -hmm. in the early councils. So you can't be premillennial, but, that's why the, the creed says, uh, you know, whose kingdom shall have no end. That was intended to exclude uh, all forms of uh, millennialism. So you would say either either on mill or post mill could be acceptable in Orthodox view. Okay. Uh, what about like Jesus in John 6? He says that 
Um, uh, what uh, he talks about, like you know, the father. He says that all that he has given to me, I shall lose none of it, and I raise them up to the last day. Doesn't that prove the Calvinistic doctrine? Uh, no, because all men are raised, right? So, in this context of recapitulation, Christ does raise all men at the last day. Nobody's lost. All human nature is resurrected, right? So Jeffrey Dahmer gets resurrected for the, on the same basis, right? So when Jesus says that all that he has given me, he's referring to like pretty much all of mankind, not like the elect. Well, it's all of the above. It's both and. It's not either one, right? So all human nature is given to Christ because he assumed universal human nature, and there is there is a fixed number of the elect, but we don't know who that is. Okay. So, and what about like a Christology? So like, how can um. How can you have something like divine nature and then, you know, human nature coexisting when they're like really the opposite? And they're not opposites, attributes. right? So they're not opposites, right? That's dialectical thinking. God made man in his image, not as a dialectical opposite. So they were all, they were all, they were always meant to go together. The incarnation is not an afterthought. Um, Damascene something. I can't read your full name. Probably gonna have to. Uh, if we keep going, I'm probably gonna get a little too sassy. So I might. Have to, I might have to just stop tonight. But what's up, Damascene? How's it going, man? Um, I had a Protestant friend reach out to me, and he was asking me the difference between the Lutheran concept of baptismal generation and the Orthodox concept. I don't know anything about the Lutheran concept. I'm wondering if you could like summarize that real quick. Well, I don't think there's a big difference just in baptismal regeneration itself from the Orthodox and the Lutheran view in terms of like doing it for an infant or doing it for an adult. Um, but I don't know that, I don't know that Lutheranism has any specific idea of uncreated grace. Uh, you know, there might be Lutheran theologians who have the opinion that they believe in un uncreated grace. But, I mean, for us, it's always couched within the holistic context of Christology. So, whether baptism regenerates, water, whether water baptism regenerates is not a point of difference between an Orthodox and a Lutheran. The basis for justification is, and what it, that grace is, differs, probably. Okay, do you think that whatever Luther might have said about regeneration, he probably got from orthodoxy originally, whether he knew it or not? I mean, Luther's just coming from an Augustinian tradition, and so, you know, the Latin Roman Catholic Augustinian Church professes baptismal regeneration, so. Okay. All right, maybe my friend's question was a little, maybe he didn't really know what he was getting at, but all right, that works. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think Luther's concerned with what the quote Orthodox church teaches. I think Luther's just kind of defaulting to the Augustinian uh, ethos. Shadia, what's up? Unmute. Hey Jay, I'm uh, here to get a little combative if that's all right. Well, might as well. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I heard you say that um, Christianity is not a religion that's proven by miracles or miraculous works. Is that an accurate um, description of your position? Yeah, I think miracles can attest to it, but they can't be a strict proof because, you know, I mean, every group, every sect will claim miracles, right? So miracles themselves can't be, quote, proof, but they can be evidences or they can attest to the religion being true. Sure. Okay, do you think that was always the case, or is this in, like, you know, a post, um, maybe, like, you know, in the church era, this is the case? Or would you say this has always kind of been the case for God's people to not, you know, prove the, tr the trueness of their religion through miracles? Well, because of the fact that at any point anybody could claim a miracle— Yes, I would say that that's always true, that the definitive proof is not going to be a miracle, but would have to be some other kind of argumentation like a worldview or, you know, something else beyond just a miracle. Okay. Let um, me, let me, can I, let me give an example of that. Like we say, well, let's say that we, let's say for the sake of argument that somebody 
put together a really solid uh, scientific paper somehow that maybe proved the um, Shroud of Turin, or they proved that the you know tomb in Jerusalem had to be the, the tomb where Jesus was and it's empty. Okay. So let's say there was like some really solid proof of the resurrection or, you know, the tomb being empty or the shroud or something like that. Right. Like that itself, that, how would that prove the total? It wouldn't prove the Christian religion because the resurrection of Jesus only makes sense with the rest of the theology. Right. Because somebody could say, okay, well maybe he just, uh, you know, Maybe, maybe uh, crazy stuff happens. Maybe he passed out. Maybe there's a lot of other things that could be brought in. So one miracle like that doesn't necessarily mean the rest of the religion is true, right? I mean, a Muslim might say, okay, well, if that was the case, uh, you know, you have other holy men who were resurrected. Okay, so what? So, you know, the Bible talks about uh, the bones of Elisha bringing somebody back from the dead. Right. Um, I guess the reason I'm asking this question is like we see in Matthew 11 when, you know, John the Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus and they're asking, you know, basically for proof that he is who he says he is. Mm -hmm. Like all of everything Jesus tells them is, is, you know, look, tell him what you've seen. Yeah, the works. Kind of goes down the list of his miracles. Yeah, the works, but you notice that Jesus also says that a wicked and adulterous son, uh, generation seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it but that of Jonah. And he says that if you know, that, remember the story of the guy who yeah, died. Yeah. If you remember the story of the guy who dies, uh, he says, "Hey, you know, he's in Abra uh, he's in torments," and he says, uh, "Let me go back and warn my brothers. If one rises from the dead, they will believe." And Jesus doesn't say yes. If they just saw a miracle of a resurrection and coming back from the dead, they would believe. No, Jesus says. They have Abraham and the prophets, and if they don't listen to Abraham and the prophets, they will not believe, though one rise from the dead. So no, I don't think Jesus is actually teaching that any kind of miracle will somehow prove the faith. The miracles attest to it. That's why he says that if you don't, if you believe, he actually gives two options. He says, believe what I taught, and you can see the scriptures, and otherwise believe on the case, on the basis of the miracles. So it's fine to believe on the basis of the miracles, but they don't prove it. Okay. Yeah, I was just looking at, you know, when he tells, go back and report to John what you hear and see. And I was also just thinking, you know, back for Moses, for example, he used miracles to prove that he, you know, was legit. Whereas the magicians, to your point, could do some form of miracles, but they kind of were proven to be lesser than what Moses did. Yeah, again, I think that in certain cases, you're right. You could have situations where God demonstrates his power being uh, above those of the, the, the challenge him. But what I'm saying is, how do I know as an individual who isn't there for any of this stuff? I just hear this stuff like I can't confirm it. And, you know, I've got a, I've got a book over uh, on my Muslim shelf of all these stories of Islamic miracles. And you see that's supposed to uh, vindicate and prove Islam for me. Right. So you see what I'm saying is like, if I'm not f physically present for these events, then how are these events going to be the final arbiter of proof? Right? So sometimes too, you could have people talking about so evidences can be called proofs in a limited sense and not in a, like a strictly philosophical sense. Right? So ev uh, miracles, I think can attest to the faith. They can be evidences for it, but they're not, proofs in a strict philosophical sense of proof okay because um, you got to have some way you got to have some way to judge between every different religious group claiming miracles right and i guess these were miracles that the person the people in these uh different passages were seeing for, exactly exactly and also remember deuteronomy 13 and deuteronomy 18 explicitly say that you have a duty not just to believe the signs and the wonders, but to test the theology. So the primary uh, way by which we judge it is on the basis of the divine revelation that comes before. Because Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18 say that when you see a, a, a prophet or a person claiming to be a prophet 
and their miracles, their signs and wonders come true, don't believe it if they tell you to do some other kind of religious practice or theology, you see. So the, the divine revelation is the primary judge, not the other way around. Okay. Um, I had a second, I guess it's somewhat related point. Um, okay. You'll read in different, uh, you know, church fathers in different places to not trust dreams, not to right. believe dreams, pre and these type of things. But then there's also a lot of stories just through church history. I mean, like St. Nicholas, for example, where really important, powerful events right. are communicated through dreams. You know, even like with, you know, St. John Chrysostom and uh, I think St. Cyril, you know, like, so it seems like there's some writings where it says don't trust dreams at all. Right. And then there's other places where, um, you know, right after a guy punches someone in the face through a dream, they're told that that's, you know, okay. And I get, I know that there, maybe it's like the level of the holiness of the person receiving the dream or something like that. But is there any... Yeah, this is the role of a spirit. This is this is the role of a spiritual father. So the know. the role of the spiritual father is precisely to help through these kinds of experiences, so that we don't fall into pre lust. Absolutely. Okay, so I guess like you know, in other words, if I thought I was having, uh, I'm not. I'm not saying this because I don't think I have any prophetic powers or dreams, but let's say that I did have a dream that I thought was prophetic or I thought God was speaking to me, right? Like what I would, the, the proper process would be, I would talk to my spiritual father about it and get his wisdom and insight. And there would be probably kind of uh, tests and, you know, people would bounce it off of other people. It wouldn't be this thing where it's like, you know, you just run with it. There would be cautious processes and steps by which we would want to make sure that it's not some kind of delusion, right? And so, well, did it, does the, if it's a, you know, I saw a dream that something's going to happen and okay, well, did it come to pass? Okay, yes, then okay, maybe it was. And then we would still, you know, it would be under the guidance of a spiritual father, right? So um, that's the process that we have. And that's why it's, it's, that's to guard against the kind of stuff that we see in the Roman Catholic Church, like in the, you know, with these crazy women saints that are, you know, talking to flying hosts and flying around the room and carving things in their chest, right? That's that's not what we do, right? We would say that's all pre list. So, but it doesn't mean that there's not miracles, clairvoyance, and spiritual gifts and all that, but that's done in the context of guidance. Okay. Cause, yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm thinking about a lot of the prophets from the Old Testament who obviously were in the minority and maybe the you know the people who would maybe in the old covenant be looked at as spiritual elders or guides were typically the people that were you know maybe compromised or whatever that were tending to prophesy like things that people wanted to hear so you know in a case like amos or some of these other guys they might not have been able to uh <laughs> you know he didn't have really any credentials to begin with and um, you know, the, well, it's not a matter of credentials. It's a matter of being in the presence of holy men and elders and, and saints, right? So it's not about academics per se. Uh, and that's why I think we would say that, you know, pe- the, the role of the elder is kind of like the role of Elijah in the schools of the prophets. So orthodoxy still has even that, that um, office beyond just, okay, yeah, there's the hierarchy of the priests and the bishop. But a lot of times the, you know, secular we could say clergy uh have been compromised and so that's right. that that's that role of the uh the sage the elder that calls you know people back to repentance even even perhaps um the the clergy right um and the, an elder can function in that kind of elijah style of role yeah that's kind of what i was imagining is if you had you know, just an Amos type of figure, just some random shepherd or, you know, just some simple person who was told something and he goes to his, well, we don't know, know that Amos didn't have, yeah, we don't, or, we don't know that Amos didn't you know. have any other holy men. Right. I mean, maybe there were, yeah, like you said, compromised, uh, you know, Levites and whatnot, but he could have still had other, you know, holy men that he interacted with. A lot of the minor prophets, you know, we only have a little, right. a little yeah. bit of, of what they said. And, you know, we don't really know much about their life. Okay. Yeah. That may, I guess it's just what I'm trying to understand maybe 
the balance between like these obvious periods where you have, you know, even today, like large portions of the church that are, you know, watered down or liberalized or, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is. And it's not a new problem. Like you see it through the old and Testament and all through the ages. Right. And sort of knowing the balance between, you know, just letting a bunch of soft liberal, you know, priests tamp down people who are, you know, they'll put whatever label on them versus, um, you know, that actually being the case, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with you. Good points. I thought you were going to be combative. You had great points. Uh, uh, and, uh, why? Sorry, I already already uh, uh, removed you there. Um, we'll give Matt one last chance to see if his phone's good, uh, but I'm kind of tired, so I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can go much longer. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, I uh, just wanted to circle back on soteriology. Soteriology. So, sorry, I'm bad at pronunciations soteriology excuse me fine it's okay um yes sir um yeah no i just wanted to talk about grace in in relation to that as well as what the orthodox perspective is yeah so i mean obviously the difference though is that we're we have two different presuppositions about what grace is right so for most protestants grace is conceived of as a dispositional change in how god views them i'm not saying that they don't believe that there's some indwelling of the Holy Spirit and understand that most Protestants think that the Holy Spirit indwells you and then now that the Holy Spirit's there it's because you are justified by faith and you know God has now changed uh, from the disposition of wrath to he likes you now so but we have a different notion I mean some of that is in our theology but we believe grace is un, uh, an uncreated energy of God so you know very different ideas at work here so when we say grace and what the Orthodox Church has in its sacraments that's what we're talking about, the uncreated grace of God. Uh, so very different from what you, you, you typically would be thinking of. Right. I, I guess, could you could you elaborate on it? I mean, like, I, that, that's a new concept to me. Right. Could so Jesus, says in, Jesus part, right? says in John 17 that he came to give us the glory that he had with the Father before the foundation of the world. So to partake of divine glory is not a creature. So that that glory isn't something created. It's an uncreated reality, which makes us immortal. So for us, grace is the gift of the Holy spirit, namely the divine energy of immortality, life, uncreated life and immortality. Right. Okay. So then as far as salvation is concerned, like that is salvation. It is being resurrected after the image of the resurrected Christ. So Christ's body is made, in that way when he's resurrected right so he's resurrected his flesh is deified it's not bound by the limitations of time and space he walks through walls he disappears etc that's the deified flesh that we believe we're eating in the eucharist so the eucharist is the summation of all of those old testament ceremonies and rituals levitical rites it is the passover of the christian and the summation of all the jewish feasts what paul calls in hebrews 13 the altar that we eat from that's not the altar that the people at the temple eat at. Okay, so could you could you tell me like where from an orthodox perspective, like where does salvation occur for an individual? Salvation begins with baptism. It's a process of of living, and it ends in final salvation in the resurrection. Okay, so in that case, is like if somebody's baptized as an Orthodox and they go through all the stuff that they need to do to, to do that, um, and but they don't live a Orthodox life, are they saved or not? No. No. Okay. So they they still have that that consecration sanctification aspect of the lifestyle, right? Well, they're uh, part of the church, but they are eventually at whatever point, whether they in this life or in the next, uh, are cut out of the covenant. So they're no longer in the covenant because they didn't live according to the strictures of the covenant. Got it. So could you uh, could you tell me the orthodox perspective on the thief on the cross? Yeah, I, I used him as an earlier example of somebody who was joined to the mystical body outside of the normative means of baptism in the Eucharist. This is also before the institution of baptism, by the way. Right. So the when when I guess the institution of baptism 
would have happened in Matthew 28. I imagine baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, sure. Um, so, are there still aspects now, are still people now that have that sort of, like, I don't know. Like, so, I already answered that. I already answered that like question that. Yeah, when, you, when you called in before. Maybe you couldn't hear me, but yes, I answered in the affirmative that there may be people who uh, are like the catechumens that are murdered in the early church who are still considered part of the church, um, and they're baptized by desire, baptized by blood, or baptized by fire. Those are different baptisms that the early church fathers talk about. Okay, so, so I, I guess that's certainly where's possible. The line drawn with uh, like, when do you, when can you tell if somebody's like salvation is authentic? We're not told that, and so what we go by is the public confession of the church, as I said. How do yeah, I know yeah, any, I, I don't know, I can't here, judge, uh, into, I can't, kind of okay, so, kind of that, was part, that was my fault. That's okay, I can't judge anybody's individual cases, I don't, I don't know their hearts, it's not my job to do that, right? Paul says, what do we have to do with judging those who are without? We judge those that are within. So God will judge those that are without, um, you know, in his way, but it's our duty to, you know, what is it, what does it say in the Old Testament, right? The things that are the, the, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children, right? And so what's revealed to us? Well, we tell people to join the Orthodox Church. That's what's revealed to us. I don't know the secret decree of God and in what ways he can join people to the mystical body of the Orthodox Church. Right. So I, and I think that I watched a video of you where... Uh, I heard you said that before. A, it was a tertiary topic where uh, you were talking about how um, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, hey, these people are doing things in your name. And he said, hey, if they're not against us, they're for us. Well, he also Can says you... they will not yeah. they will not always be against us, right? And so uh, there's nobody who can do a miracle in my name who will uh, always be against us. And if you look in the book of Acts, it's I think chapters 8, 9, and then 18 and 19, you'll find two cases where the apostles find disciples of John and disciples of the Lord who were not fully instructed. And so what they do is bring them under the episcopate. They appoint bishops in those places. So the fact that there are people at that time period in redemptive history, before the establishment of the church at Pentecost, that's not a proof of ecumenism or the idea that there is no visible church structure because Pentecost is still yet to happen. And that's a really important event in redemptive history. So Pentecost is the real birth of the church, right? And that's where the church is empowered to go forth and if you look at the New Testament, it's very clear that the church is setting up a successive, visible structure which can, uh, with authority, judge the church. Okay, so in, I think it's Acts 9, if Philip goes and it's the story of the magician that had some uh, some conversion-ish policy, or like he, something happened with him, and, uh, and he was actually baptized, and then Peter showed up on the scene with that. You're talking about Simon Magus, it, right? Yeah. Yeah. What about it? I, I, I'm just curious about that because that that's so Philip was baptizing people and was talking the gospel to them. But then Peter showed up on the scene giving Holy Spirit. So what, I, I yeah, don't that's called Philip chrismation. Peter thing yeah, going that's on there. Chris that well, chrismation and anointing of the Holy Spirit occurs throughout the book of Acts. Right. But what was Philip not doing that Peter was doing? Well, doesn't Peter lay? Isn't there a chrismation that occurs? Is that yeah, what you're referring to? He says that he lays hands on it, but like, was Peter, was was Philip not like allowed to do? Was he not able to do that? Um. Well, what was Philip a deacon? I'm trying to remember. I, I was don't he a deacon? Top of my head, but he was one of the twelve, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it could be that uh, he wasn't there, or he he wasn't endued with, or didn't know about, like the full initiation into the Christian mysteries like chrismation. So it's, it's certainly possible he didn't know about chrismation. Sure. I mean, it's not like everybody in the book of acts knows the fullness of what every, what, what all is coming. Right. For example, Peter has to learn about uh, the dietary laws, right? Because in chapter 10, Peter still thinks that we're supposed to keep the Jewish dietary laws and God has to give him the vision of the sheet to convince him. So even Peter doesn't fully know what's going on. But we do we do see the principle of the laying on of hands to receive the Holy Spirit in the Book of Acts, and which is not just ordination; it's also chrismation, which is the uh, Orthodox sacrament. Yeah, I guess uh, I, I'm not familiar with chrismation as the sacrament. Could you tell me what that is, real quick, just so I know? 
Yeah, so this is the anointing uh, that James talks about, uh, anointing with oil, and it's what we do to... I mean, if, a ba if an infant is baptized, he's also chrismated, but it signifies the individual's personal Pentecost. So it's a ritual with holy oil of anointing. It's what we see in the book of Acts. Right, right, right. So, okay. So, yeah, I, I, I understand that. Um, I, I guess my, my question would be, like, uh, because I guess it's circling back into this idea of, of grace, which you say we have differing definitions on, that's all right. Uh we like so you have you like how do you evangelize like into countries that are like basically all they have like when you give them the gospel that's literally all they have you don't have an orthodox priest priest there to be able to like give them chrismation you don't have an orthodox priest there. okay well i mean Chris, people you know, okay, yeah. okay so people do the best that they can but if you if you know the history of the church it is the church actually setting up churches and ordaining people and doing the liturgy so that's the only historical church there is, is that this, this, so, so is Protestantism going out and spreading the gospel? That's not like, the gospel. Is that a vein or not the, effort? it's not the gospel. The gospel is what the totality of the theology of the Orthodox church is the gospel. There's no scaled down Romans road. That is the gospel. Okay. So I, I see what you're saying. So as far as somebody, if you're, if you only have the scriptures, the, let's uh, just say the canon, the canonical scriptures so why would we make the exemptions to the rule the rule here the what i detect here is just this idea that uh well it's lowest common denominator and because somebody like this so the thief on the cross uh you know is is, is saved in a uh you know uh out of the ordinary way so the out of the ordinary now is the normative way and it's just that's it's it's reverse you got it backwards like the normative way is not that the normative way is that there's a historic church that exists from the time of the apostles that put the Bible together and has this ritual that they do called the liturgy. And they have this introductory rite called baptism and they have chrismation and they have all these things that you find in the Orthodox church. So the normative way for like modern ish cultures, right? Like there's a lot of cultures out there that like going on missions that they don't have those cultures. Am I correct? Or they don't have that ability. Like, so if like, for instance, Okay, but I mean, in the book of in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, you know, in the Bibles, and they talk about Christ and talk about hey, that's okay, that's good, but but none of that's the gospel, right? And even in the book of Acts, they're even told at one point not to go into Asia Minor. The Holy Spirit tells them not to go into Asia Minor. I don't know why, but so um, you know, the why God's providence doesn't yet have the Orthodox Church in certain areas, I don't know. But none of what you're saying really has anything to do with whether the, there is a visible public church in history or not. I'm not trying to be rude to you. I'm just saying, like, the fact that a Protestant can send a Bible to China, like, what does it have to do with whether or not there's a historic visible church or not? Well, I guess, like, I mean, the churches in the first century started off as, like, quote-unquote house churches. Yeah, but that's the, yeah, but when you look into actual liturgical church historians explaining the house churches, it's not what you think it is. They have altars, right? They have liturgical baptismal fonts. They're, convert, they're houses that are, like, basilicas converted into churches. So it's not what Protestants think of, like, this low church thing. In fact, liturgy is celebrated in those houses. And, right. and even so, Protestants, like, I guess, like, where did that precedent start, though? Because, like, if you're coming off of the upper room, you just had everything like land on you, your Holy Spirit's on you, all that type of stuff. They didn't sit there and like write out like. Hey, yes, this they is did. What we're doing. Yes, they did. The apostles went and they set up liturgical worship in churches that are like synagogues and temples. So the actual history of the church is a combination of temple worship and synagogue worship in liturgical fashion. And the apostles directly borrowed that from the synagogue and the temple liturgies. And that's unanimous amongst even Protestant history, historians of liturgy. So in your perspective, what is the most effective form of e like evangelizing nations or peoples? Or people the way the church did it for the, the, the way the church uh, did it for the first yeah. thousand years and still does it. And it's not the Protestant way. Yeah, I, I, I'm, so we have different yeah, ideas of what Christianity the, is. The, we have different ideas. We have different ideas of what Christianity is, right? For us, it's not getting them a Bible and getting them into doing their private devotions. It's the living the liturgical rhythm and life of the church to achieve theosis so that they have a good resurrection.
Right. Two totally different ideas. Anyway, uh, I'm not, I'm sorry. I just can't keep going. I know you're going to ask, yeah, constantly ask questions. I got to go. I'm super tired. Um, uh, anyway. All right. Thank you guys. Let's do the super chats. We got uh, quite a few here and I'll never get through these. If we don't go ahead and do it. TJ, $1, please do more music and comedy. I love the cringe core. I'm sure that uh, as the inspiration comes, there will always be an infinite well of cringe core. DC Woodworking, $3. No question, I'm enjoying the streams. God bless. Thank you so much, DC Woodworking. Daniel Brent, $10. I enjoy your content. My family and I, after research and prayer, started attending a local Antiochian Orthodox church. We enjoyed the service, and it was unapologetic and strong. Do you have any advice for somebody converting? Uh, just keep at it. Get an Orthodox study Bible. Um, big fan of the Orthodox study Bible. And, uh, you know, just keep going to church. Daniel Brent, $5. Follow up on the request for advice. Are there big controversies I should be aware of in Eastern Orthodoxy? Um, I would just stay away from the uh, liberal-minded clergy pushing obvious liberal things. So you do that, you'll be good. Majorian, $20. Do ev evolutionary atheists have a real argument against social Darwinism or eugenics? I would say no. Uh, I never hear a good one. Maybe there is some evolutionary proponent who could go in that direction. But you'll notice that that's all bound up with the history of their thesis. All of them across the board would decry that nowadays, at least most of them, not all of them, but 99% of them would. And uh, you're saying, is it an arbitrary cope? Absolutely. Um Itchy Cornhole, $10. Keep up the good work. Love your content. Thank you. Gary, $25. Related to Jesus as the Logos, is it correct to say that logic and mathematics are part of God's uncreated energies? No. So logic and mathematics are features of the created order. They're logical structures that are also created, applicable to the created order. However, they do have their analog, uh, which they're based on, in the divine mind, which are logi, which are energies. So um, the answer is kind of both. But the number seven is created, but it has a uh, a, a grounding uh, in the divine mind, which is the divine mind, right? The logi of the number seven. Random username, one, two, three, four, seven, nine, one, five dollars. Can you touch on why polygamy was outlawed and why? Because uh, it wasn't the original intention in the Garden of Eden. And I think that uh, Christ is returning us back to uh, what was intended for uh, man in the Garden. Uh, Jay Zuna, $10. Do you have thoughts on churches taking government money to feed and place migrants? Uh, yeah, that's a control mechanism for social engineering and for uh, buying off and politically steering and controlling the churches. Is it wrong? Absolutely. P. Divine, $50. I love your stuff. Thank you for the Q&A. Thank you so much, P. Divine. He wins the Super Chat. Weapon tonight, war tonight. To Terry, seventy-seven, five dollars. There's a new papal document affirming the Alexandria document. Oh, good. Yeah, we got to look at that. Um, I'll have to go into. I can't pull up links from uh, Streamlabs OBS, so let me go over to Streamlabs and find the original link. Good grief, it's hot, man. I'm freaking sweating in here. People get me all riled up. Um, where's the super chats? All the super chats. Let's see here. Comments, creator. Oh man, I'll never find this. I want to pull that up because that's Jamie. Could you turn the air on? It's super hot in here. Oh, dripping, dude. Jamie. She's in the bed. Oh, she can't hear me. Tip history. Here we go. Here we go. Press Vatican publication. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Francis already approved of both the key 80 document and uh, Alexandria document, right? Oh man, it's putting the whole freaking. I don't want all that. I just want that. There we go. Let's see what this says. <clears throat> Audience with members of the delegation from the Ecumenical Patriarchate, Feast of Peter and Paul. 
uh, follow, Pope's address. So here's Francis. Does it mention the Alexandria document? I wish the good outcome of the plenary session of the dialogue uh, at the Alexandria. Yeah, okay, so there you go. So Francis is, uh, uh, does Francis call out all the admissions in the Alexandria document, The basically admitting 90% 90, 90 of what Orthodox apologists have been arguing for the last thousand years? No, Francis says uh, he's happy with it. Roman Catholics, where are you at? Francis affirms the Alexandria document which goes even further than the Chieti document. So Roman Catholics, I don't want to hear this nonsense that, oh, it's not infallible. It doesn't matter. Because if it's admit admitting the heresies of the Orthodox schism church, then Francis is a heretic. It's very simple. It doesn't matter what authority Francis puts behind the document if the document is teaching heresy. That would mean that Francis is a fodder of heresy, a supporter of heresy. Thank you for that, Terry. Tronicle, $5. For your information, the Matt guy ha ha makes blasphemous comments about the Theotokos. Uh, let's see if we can pull that up. The Matt guy. I guess that's the Protestant guy that we were just talking to. Let's see what he says. Oh, man. Come on. Oh, it's so hot in here. The Matt guy. Let's see what the Matt guy says. Oh, so he's mad about icons. Do you lick the image? So. Oh, yeah. Gross, dude. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I mean, that's... Standard Protestant fair. Shogun, $10. What's your best argument against Orientals? Go watch David's videos and the interviews that we've done. Uh, David and I have done many uh, interviews on this. They say that the distinctions are uh, caught up in noia. I know. Yeah, we've covered that. Terry, $77, $5. What do you think of John Frame? Uh, I, don't, I don't really... I'm not a huge fan of John Frame. I mean, I think that Apologetics to the Glory of God has, has a couple of interesting chapters that were insightful. Um, but I mean, I just don't think that Calvinists can really do anything with metaphysics, right? So you're saying that John frame can, uh, almost seems orthodox in some ways because of the dedication to Van Til and, uh, yeah, I mean, again, there are overlaps there, but there's just severe deficiencies because they just don't really get. Orthodox Trinitarian theology, which would, which would really give them a better metaphysic. Mr. Anderson, five dollars. Would you say that Roman Catholic arguing that Moses? What would you say to Roman Catholic arguing that Moses is a type of the Pope? Yeah, I mean, this is just a fanciful eisegesis because uh, I mean, you could make a connection between Moses and the bishopric, but I mean. The New Testament and, you know, the majority of the apologetics of the early church is concerned with Moses as a type of Christ. And really that obsession with finding types of the papacy is, is, a, is a very late development. It doesn't happen until the controversies over the papacy, particularly if you look at the uh, history of the, um, after the two rival eighth councils. So... Uh, I just read this really good article on this from Ortho Christian Dr. Ford. Let me give you this. Uh, this is a really good article here. Let me pull that up. Yeah, here it is. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because this article um, cites a lot of the sources you've seen me cite over the years. The Dragas article. Um, and he goes into... He goes into the relationship of uh, these kinds of disputes after Rome's acceptance of the Phocian Council. So for 200 years, Rome accepted the Phocian Council, the Eighth Council, and then later on after the Gregorian reforms, key element there, key period. Oh, now we're going to go back and say we accept the Ignatian Council. 
right? Because that has the so-called papal claims. And I wouldn't be surprised if that wasn't uh, connected with the that period of the, the forgeries. Um, so there's that article by Dr. Ford that I recommend on that. Um, so in other words, after this period of the uh, Rome reversing its stance on the Eighth Council and accepting the Ignatian Eighth Council instead of the Phocian Eighth, Co Eighth Council, uh, then they started to say and need more and more vindications for the the new role of the Bishop of Rome. So, oh, well, then he's got to be the new Moses, right? And how can we fish through the scriptures to find Moses as a type of the Pope? Um, do we find that in the patristic era? Not really, no. Um, I mean, maybe as Cyprian says, you could find these Old Testament figures as archetypes of all of the bishops right peter as the every bishop is peter is what cyprian and many church fathers say augustine says that right terry 70 uh, excuse me golden arm 75 dollars. wow thank you so much are you still working on a book on catholicism um well sort of i mean all of the essays that i did got put into the red book so if you want the version of that the immediate version of that, this is 600 pages, 660 pages, and has about two or 300 pages dealing with Roman Catholicism, so you could get the Red Book. Um, but the Red Book was not made by me. It was all my essays that somebody put together, so it's not technically my book, even though it is my book, but it's uh, it's not ideal. It's uh, just kind of slammed together a bunch of essays. So it really needs to be redone and put into a better format. And, you know, uh, I've learned a lot since I wrote a lot of those essays. I think most of the essays hold up, but, you know, I've gotten a lot deeper into the energy stuff and, um, you know, later synods, the Palamite synods and so forth. So I've learned a lot since a lot of those essays. So they would have to be severely updated, but maybe one day. Terry, $77, $1. I bought Ultimate Proof of God and Experience of God, Volume 1 of Stan Eloy. Thank you for the suggest suggestions. I was a presuppositional reform person, head to orthodoxy. Thank you for your work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You will definitely enjoy Stan Eloy's orthodox dogmatics. Um, and you will notice areas where Van Til overlap with orthodoxy. And you'll notice the deficiencies and the blind spots where uh, you know, Van Til wasn't able to get, get there. All right, thank you guys so much, and uh, tomorrow's going to be fun because we will be uh, doing all of Indiana Jones, not just uh, the new one. We'll, we're going to do them all. So we had a lot of fun watching all the Indiana Jones, and we will have a good podcast. It'll be fun on that after we go see the new one. Uh, also, remember, head over to chalk.com, C-H-O-Q.com. Use the promo code J50 to get 50% off Tonkat Ali boosting testosterone and as rachel pointed out women also can take the tonkat ali i was under the impression maybe they shouldn't no actually it turns out women can take chalk.com if you want to boost those energy levels it's not actually disadvantageous to the ladies so i got shown up by rachel there seven wonders great for uh, mineral deficiency uh she legit great for mental focus and clarity jamie takes she legit quite often there's also Action 2.0 and all kinds of other adaptogens over there at Chalk.com that will improve your diet. They're not magic pills. You have to also have good diet, getting some good exercise and uh, all of that. But it will help you out in terms of mineral deficiency. So uh, use promo code JAY50 to get 50% off. And uh, Chalk is an excellent red pill based company. And they've been our supporter, uh, our sponsor for two years now. So head on over 